Greetings and salutations. This is Jamal, and I'm with a sister in Christ, Julia Shalom Jordan. What were the crazy supernatural experiences you had in your life? So I I didn't really have too many crazy ones, but I'd say around the age of 8 or 10, my grandfather was involved in Scientology, mm-hmm. and they taught him how to do certain things and um of course, he didn't teach me everything, but he would teach me little things along the way, like how to bend a spoon with your mind and, and how to astral project. Wow. And, um, and astral projection for me was very fun. And I, and I did it a, a, a lot when I was younger. I didn't know that it was wrong. So, mm. um, I did that in my sleep. And, um, and then my senior year of high school, my brother and I witnessed a UFO hovering about above our home. And, um, it was crazy. That 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 really weirded me out. But it kind of. Um, other than that, I just didn't have any um, insane outward supernatural experiences. But mind you, when my brother and I played the Ouija, I got possessed with him at the same time. My demons lay dormant, and they didn't manifest until about twelve years later. Mm-hmm. Um, but during the years that I was estranged from my family, my sister shared with me that she was being spiritually tormented. She would see this um this shadow of a man with a hat on that would watch her at night. Wow. And sometimes I would feel things touch me at night and and I always explain these things away. Oh my gosh, that that couldn't be a hand, that's gotta be my sheets or whatever. But I could sense evil around me and perceive things that my other friends couldn't and they always thought I was a very strange kid, just even as a kid, I was <laughs> sensitive to the spiritual realm. Yeah. But um I feel like the enemy is really tricky. He doesn't always come out with the guns blazing, you know? Especially if he thinks that'll freak you out so bad that it, that you might actually turn to God or start looking for God. So in my case, he kind of seduced me. So he didn't really draw me in with too many weird experiences, but more of more or less um just seducing me. And the best examples in my life for, for how I, I felt the spiritual powers were when I was dancing. And at this mm. time, I didn't know it at this time, but I was actually possessed with demons. Yeah. But there, there was two experiences that really stand out. And when it happened, I didn't, I thought, wow, this is amazing. I felt like I had superpowers. I didn't even know that it was a demonic experience. I, I just labeled it as a, wow, I had a wow experience. But um, one of them was, and I, I remember where I was standing on stage. It was so crazy. I was, I was actually dancing that night, and I was on stage. And I could feel a power overtake me while I was on the stage. And it was really strange because I remember I was bending over and as I lifted my body up and I, I had my hands kind of, you know, stroking up my leg. And as I was moving up, I could feel a power enter my body and it just, mm. my whole body tingled. I felt wow. high, like completely energized and relaxed at the same time. It's, it's very hard to explain. And the crazy part was the whole room stopped and just stared at me. And it was like time stood still and. Everyone was staring at me and my heart was beating faster, but not out of fear. I was totally like excited and it was like thrilling to, to feel such power at, and control over everyone in the room. I just felt like, um, like this power actually got me a response from the crowd. So it was not only tangible inside my body, but I mean, I was also tangible to people that were watching and, and looking at me. So they were responding to the, what I could feel and it was just, it but was incredible. So funny. I just thought, like, oh my gosh, I felt on top of the world. I felt like Shira. I felt like <laughs> so powerful. And then there was another experience I had in Mexico while, when I was modeling. Yeah. And um, so I'm just gonna warn you ahead of time. It's kind of a little long story, but it's, right, it's ahead, interesting. I, so I have all my um, <laughs> okay, okay. Good. So I was so I I was a Hawaiian tropic girl, and I had done you know Maxim stuff and. Soap magazine. So I did all these sexy photo shoots and, um, my career was kind of a little bit in the like, there was nothing really happening and there was a contest to go to Mexico. And, and this was an unusual thing because I didn't usually pay for to enter a contest. Usually, um, when I did like Hawaiian traffic, they paid my way to go to Hawaii a couple of times. And, you know, so this time it was a shoot in Mexico, but they said, you, you have to pay your way there. But once you're there, you get to shoot with all these photographers. And then if you win, you win this great big modeling contract. So I was like, okay, you know what? 
maybe this, I, I have to spend a little money to make a little money. So I'm going to, I took off of work. I really got ready. So I, I mean, I really dieted and exercised. I went to the gym twice a day. So I was in great condition. I was just at the top of my game and go out to Mexico. And, um, and you know, there, and I'm not saying this to brag. I'm just being real mm -hmm. that there was girls that were not prepared. They weren't in condition. I'm not saying they were horrible or whatever, but they weren't taking it seriously. So, you know, I was taking it seriously with diet and exercise and, and, you know, and I was like, and people were coming up to me. Oh my gosh, you do it. You've got this. You're, you're, this is in the bag for you. You totally won this contest. And I felt very confident that I did. I've done, I did a million contests. So I was like, you know what? You're probably right because these girls were not in the best condition, you know? So anyway, I'm shooting there in Mexico all week long. And what they didn't tell us is we had to sign a contract when we got out there that all the pictures that we took, they had the rights to. So that really made me upset because I'm a paid model. So every single time your image is out there, what you're doing is, if you're working for free, the more you're associated, they could sell your pictures and you're associated with other products and you could be losing royalties on things that your image is associated with. Mm -hmm. And I knew that a lot of these girls were like, Oh yeah, well, we're taking free pictures. I'm like, you don't understand. Like if I want to get a contract with a certain company, let's say a competitor company said, Oh, we used your image. Um, then I would lose a contract. So it's just, it, it really made me upset. I felt like we were being used because we weren't getting paid and we signed the rights away to our photos. So anyway, so I said, whatever, I'm just going to get through this thing and, you know, get a modeling contract. So the contest happens and I didn't win. And, um, and it was a girl that was not in good condition. So I was like, <laughs> but she was friends with the owner, which yeah. really made me upset. Cause I said, you know, if it was going to be this unprofessional, if that's how it was, then I would have, I'd rather have worked at home and saved my money and saved my trouble. So I was angry. And so the makeup artists and a couple of other models and, um, and photographers were, were sitting at a table and over, overhearing me just like talking with other people. And I was just like, I can't believe we wasted our time. And, and, um, this, uh, makeup artist came up to me and she said, I, I really think you should have won. I'm really upset for you, but, um, I think we could use your energy. And I'm like, what do you mean? She goes, well, um, why tomorrow we had the very next day we had a, a big photo shoot out on the beach. And she goes, why don't you meet us on the other side of the beach? I, me and a, a group of photographers, we're going to set up our own photo shoot and, and we're only picking certain models that we want to work with. And, um, you know, you will be a part of something different and you don't have to work for free. We're going to make sure you get these images and, but you know, this will be your thing. It'll be artistic. So I was like, okay, she piqued my interest. I was so angry. I was like, you know, I'm not going to work for them for free anymore. So I met them on the other side of the beach. I get there and everyone's, you know, sitting there. I close my eyes. I do my makeup. I open my eyes. I have never seen myself look like this. They, I look like a witch. I, I open my eyes. My face is white. My lips are black. My nails are black. They have given me a black wig and they slicked my hair back and spray painted my, my own hair to blend in with this wig that they gave me. And I look like a witch pretty much and a very goth, you know, dominatrix. And then they gave me this latex outfit and a whip and everything. And I'm oh, like, wow. what the heck is this? You know, I've been, <laughs> I've never, I'm, I'm used to modeling where you're shooting beautiful pictures. You're trying to look beautiful. And I look in the yeah. mirror and I'm like, this is not attractive. This is not <laughs> what I'm used to. And she's like, listen, don't worry about it. If this is art and you're going to be part of this like Swedish photography book, that's, um, it's, it's on, um, it's a coffee table book. It, there's no nudity. It's all, you know, it's classy, of course, because there's no nudity. And so she goes, but you know, I want to, we want to use that anger and that energy. We feel like that you really have something there. And so I said, you know what? I've gone this far. Why not just do it? So I stood up. And they start taking the pictures and they're, they're just kind of like, you know, you should have won. And they're just egging me on. And I just felt the same feeling, just this buzzing sensation just shoot through my body. And I felt like I could have picked up a boulder and thrown it. I had so much energy. I had so much like, it was unbelievable. I felt like yeah. a superhero and it was this rage and it was just unbelievable. So I'm shooting these pictures. I look like a different person in these pictures. And, um, 
we get, we wrap up and I'm still buzzing from the energy. I'm like physically high from it. And I'm like, I can't believe it. I loved doing that photo shoot. That was my favorite photo shoot. I had so much fun. I was so in character and, and, um, anyway, that, that to me, like when I look back at it, I go, Oh my gosh. Well, what was she doing? She was tapping into my rage, you know? And that's a spirit. You yeah, know, you can either tap into something good or tap into something bad. And because my life was already so off what God wanted, you yeah. know, I'd already given myself over to these spirits. Now where I've made myself available as a vessel for them, I physically felt it right. in my body. And it was n- not until I had actually realized I had demons. I was like, wow, these are actual times I can remember when a demon filled me where I could feel that. Wow. So. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Um, so, what were like the the doorways or legal rights you opened or sins you committed um, for the enemy to come into your to your life or your body? So, from that example, instead of fighting it, you know, I gave into the power. Like I agreed with it. It felt good. I got high. The devil didn't freak me out with weird supernatural freakiness. He seduced me. Like this felt good. So giving into the anger and the rage at the photo shoot, it felt really good. And when I was on stage, the power over men was just intoxicating. I just mm. loved having that control over people. Wow. And um, I'm going to read you a couple Bible verses because sure, sure. I really feel like these just will help people understand from God's perspective. You know, we think this is normal. It feels good to have power, but this is what God feels about it. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who could know it? So just because it felt good to me doesn't not mm. mean that was good to God, you know? And then there's another, another Bible verse that says, For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Amen. So I was sowing to my flesh, and what actually felt good at that moment was at it was eating me away eventually. It, it actually just started to destroy me. Mm. I had to have power. I had, to, it was something that I had to have. And when I lost it, I got anxious. When I wasn't the top girl at the club, then, then that was a problem. Do you, you know, so it was like a right. drug that unless I was getting fed that attention or, you know what I mean? Mm. Then, then I was, then I needed another hit, you know? Yeah. So it was never ending for me. Wow, that's, so. that's kind of reminiscent of, uh, of Beyonce. You know, she said that when she goes up on stage, you know, something enters her and it's not really her. It's just some kind of like a spirit that enters her and takes control of her. That's, that's very fascinating. Um, so what oh. were, what are your thoughts on Christians having demons inside their body? A lot of Christians think that, um, a Christian cannot have a demon inside their body. What do you think about that? You know, um, I think it is possible for demons to inflict any soul who submits them. So here's my two cents on it. I think the, the, the word saying demonic possession, that's, that's incorrect. Yeah. I guess, um, what it is, it's basically, um, it's, it's demonic infestation. That's how I see it. So let's right. say you own a house. You could let, you could not take care of that house and rats could infest it, you know, and rats could affect it. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean the rats own the house, you know, you open up the door for them. And that's kind of like what I feel like is going on with Christians having them is so, um, this is why continual repentance is so important for a believer. Mm-hmm. We each decide whom we serve because sinning is natural. I don't think because you sin that you have a demon, but continually and willfully sinning in any area reveals that the enemy has gotten a foothold in your life. Amen. That basically Satan has more power than God in, in this area. And that is something that Satan will exploit. You know, um, anyway, I'm sorry, you sounded like you were going to say something. No, go keep going. Uh, like, so, yeah, you're, you're totally on point in my opinion. Yeah, keep, keep going. <laughs> so, you know, in Jesus' ministry, he cast demons out of people that were in the synagogue. So that makes you wonder if these people were going to church, they're going, you know, to their synagogue, they were practiced, they were religious, right? So how many people are taking on the label of a Christian, but they're not actually following Christ with their heart? You know, it might be a question of wrong labeling. People might think that there's something that they're not. Some people think they're a Christian, 
but they're really not, you know. Or it might be a Christian has opened up the door and they're not really possessed, but they're being oppressed. Mm -hmm. So this is what the Bible says. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. So I think about it like this. I made a commitment to my husband. I can cheat on him and walk away from him. But are we still married? Yeah. But my cheating shows that my heart is no longer with my husband. And I believe that's the best way to describe Christians with um, demonic infestation. I hate to say possession because I don't believe that Satan can, d demons can own something that yeah. signifies ownership. Right. Um, but the Spirit of God will work to bring that person back to Christ. It's still a choice of their will. So I believe that if a person decides not to love God anymore, God will accept that. And I believe that people can change their mind, that we must choose who we will serve every day. And um, God looks on the heart. So if your heart is no longer with him, it doesn't matter what title you claim. So the Israelites were God's people, right? But mm -hmm. they kept turning to other gods. Like the whole Old Testament is just, it's just pretty much a reflection of how they kept going back to other gods. And so this is not about a bloodline inheritance. It's a matter of the heart. You know, it's a matter of, um, well, God was pursuing the Israelites. No matter how many times that they had turned to other gods, God continually pursued them. And um, he's doing that with every believer, every right. Christian that has walked away from him. I, I loved God when I was a little girl, and I wanted to serve him and be a missionary. And then I ended up being a stripper, which is just insanity to me. Mm -hmm. But you know what? God saw that, hey, this girl walked away from me. I'm going to pursue her. Mm -hmm. So. Um, anyway, I've got a couple Bible verses I want to get off my chest because I think these are so important. Go ahead, share it, please. So it says, I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give each man according to his ways, according to the results of his deeds. And I've got a couple verses on deception of Christians. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. And for if someone comes and proclaims Jesus other than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit than the one you received or a different gospel than the one you accepted, you put up with it way too much. And so I believe that Christians right now are being attacked. The, the church is being attacked. There's a lot of other things being thrown into Christian churches that are not of God. I don't believe that you could do yoga and, and throw in Bible verses because I, I so strongly feel like this whole yoga spirit is this antichrist spirit that is leaking into, especially the United States, just like crazy. Amen. And what it's Amen. doing is it's putting Christians and believers into a spiritual slumber where they're not able to discern what is God and what is not God. Amen. We don't mix the two. You don't mix God and an abomination. God, God is disgusted by that. And I hate to sound so dogmatic, but if you read what the Lord feels about that, I don't, I don't want to play, dude. There's other things I can do at the gym without, that won't be an abomination to God. Mm -hmm. I mean, my abs can get tight without yoga. I can do something else. Can I not give up one or two things for my love of the Lord? So, you know, my friends think I'm crazy and weird <laughs> and too, too, um, too, you know, too extreme, but I just feel it, this, this sorrow from the Lord yeah. for, for wanting to please man whether, rather than him. Mm -hmm. So anyway. Awesome. Awesome. Um, so growing up, did you play with the occult or partake in any rituals and how does it open oneself to the demonic realm? You know, Okay, so yeah. um, what my grandfather was, you know, he kind of got my appetite a little bit wet for the spiritual realm. I knew there was something else out there. Mm -hmm. And so, but I also grew up in the church and I knew that my mom was like against anything like that. So when I went away to university, I went to Northern Illinois. I was, um, you know, away from the house for the first time, just on my own. And I'm living, um, you know, in the dormitory and, you know, girls are, Saturday night, it's rainy outside. Let's go do the Ouija board. So my friend down the hall oh, was wow. like, Hey, you know, you should try this. And, and, you know, people did it a little bit and she did it actually a lot. 
Well, I said, okay, you know, I've never done anything like that. I want to try it. So I tried it. She goes, oh, my gosh, Julia, this thing loves you. I've never oh, seen wow. it work so strongly. So she would ask me to come play with her because she just loved how strong it would work when I would sit on it. So I thought that, you know, that was a little something I dabbled in. It wasn't like I was an, an outright devil worshiper. I was just a kid at college playing with the Ouija board, and it actually worked. So, um, but, you know, there was tarot cards at my work. So when I became a dancer, there was a lot of white witches at my work. They would literally wear, like, these necklaces and do certain rituals and, and you know, smoke certain things to get, you know, um, favor with mm. men, money, you know, wow. they would have, they would wear charms at work. And that's interesting. I want, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I said, I said that's interesting. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so they would do little things and they would, you know, to, to get more money at work or whatever. And I didn't really, they said, oh, I, I, we're a white witch. We're, we only do blessings and good things. We don't do anything bad. I'm like, all right, whatever, to eat your own. I mean, this is a bunch of strippers. So yeah. my one girlfriend was a good, really good person. She kept giving me this evil eye bracelet. This will bring you good luck because all these girls are jealous. This will bring you good luck. And so she gave it to me. And every single time, like, I would wear it, it would break right away. So she goes, well, you know what that means is people are sending curses at you. And and I, and I took it as a sign. You don't want that. God does not want me to wear that, whatever that is. So <laughs> I just said, you know what, honey, you don't have to buy me another. But she kept buying me a new one. I was like, don't, don't buy it. Don't spend your money. So, um. So that was a little thing from work. And then we we actually had somebody that would read tarot cards in the back room. We had what was called a house mom that would cook us food and, and um, sew our, if we ripped our dress, she would sew it up. And um, if it was a slow night, she would just be there to kind of chat with us and encourage us. Um, and um, she, our house mom actually read tarot cards. So she made extra money on the side and did that. So that was easily available. And astrology cards. She would do astrology cards and all those kind of things. Astrology charts. Mm -hmm. And um, this is kind of interesting. I my best friend was involved in Santeria, mm -hmm. and I didn't. She didn't really. It wasn't really in your face. I didn't know until I actually ended up moving in with her, and I was going through a really, really deep depression. And um, she said, Julia. You know, I, I'm involved in this religion and um, I really want to pay for you to get blessed. <laughs> now, you know, that's pretty bad if you have to pay to get a blessing. That's why I don't like those prosperity gospel, because it reminds me so much <laughs> of the demonic churches that you have to pay. If God's not your pimp. God's not your drug dealer. God's not. You don't have to pay him. Amen. For, you know, <laughs> so that's how I feel about that. But so she was like, I, you know, I'm going to pay for you to get blessed and so I was like, okay, you know, so desperate. I have, I was so far away from my family. I was estranged from them. I couldn't talk to them. I just was like, just confused. So I go to her basement. She goes, meet, um, I'm going to meet my mother-in-law in the basement. She's going to be performing a ceremony. I paid her for her to do this for you. I'm like, okay. Yeah. So I go downstairs in the basement. She's like, well, I want you to go upstairs and take the ceremonial. But I went through this whole thing where she took a chicken and she cut off her head, wow. poured the blood all over me. Yeah. I mean, it was insane. And so then I, I had to wear, I had to take a path. I had to, like eight hours. I had to wear this weird thing on my head. And I'm like, as I'm doing it, I'm getting dizzy. Like I'm, so I'm having another suit. I feel like I'm being doped, but I'm not, I haven't taken any drugs. So there's a physical reaction in my body from this happening. I'm like, wow, I don't feel so good. You know, like, and then after it was over, she gave me these beads and said, you know, you know, you can come to us and we can, if you want extra blessings at work, we can do certain ceremonies and you'll make lots of money. That's how your, that's how your friend makes all this money at work. She was like a real big money maker. And I was like, oh, okay. So I get upstairs and I'm like feeling nauseous and I'm looking at these beads and I'm like, I can't do this. So something inside my gut said, give them back. Like, you don't need this. Mm. And I looked at her husband and I said, I'm so sorry to offend you guys. I know you spend a lot of money, but something inside just, I cannot, I can't have these beads. I can't do this thing. This is just not right for me. And he looked at me like he knew what I was talking about. And he was like, I knew that you, I knew that you couldn't do it. And I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, I, I don't know. There's something about you. He's like, I, there's something about you that's around you that I could feel is different. 
and I can't put my finger on wow. what it is. So, you know, it was the Holy Spirit. Yeah, you yeah. know, so even when I was going through all that oppression, God I believe it was the Holy Spirit that he was recognizing, you know? So, yeah. anyway. Wow. Um, yeah, let me just say uh, <laughs> to the people who are listening, um, all witchcraft is bad. White witchcraft, black witchcraft, <laughs> it's all demonic. It's all from the same source, Satan. Yeah. I just want to put right. that out there. Um, you know, yeah. I, I wanted to say that, I, I forgot to even mention this, but, you know, I returned the beads to my friend, mm -hmm. and but I did not repent to God. Yeah. So basically, that spiritual door was still open. So it would be like me cheating on my husband and not acknowledging or, or saying I'm sorry. When we don't repent to God, it kind of shows that we truly aren't sorry. Mm -hmm. So there's a couple Bible verses I think that are really important. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is a sin. So God takes that as a sin, you know, like, and then uh, there's another Bible verse. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. I did not have my full armor on. And mm -hmm. that's where confusion can come in. That's when someone can say, so how I got involved with Scientology, I mean, um, Santeria, when my friend said, look, we believe in Jesus. We believe in Mary. Yeah. Look, see, we even honor and respect him. And then I let my guard down. I said, you know what? This can't be an abomination. They believe in Look at, she's got little statues of Jesus everywhere. <laughs> right. But she also had little statues of, um, they were like, they look like African. I can't describe it. They had little conch shells for the eyes. They were, they were real scary. She had them like around the house and they, I felt like they were always watching me. Yeah. Which, I kind of think they probably were, but. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The Bible reads, uh, demons are behind the idols. So, you know, if you have any idols in your house, I would recommend you get rid of it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, this is funny because like just the other day and you would think I, cause I've been dealing with this stuff for a while. I've been dealing with it for a while. So I'm like, just the other day, the Lord convicted me of something that was in my drawer. So I'm, I'm sitting at my desk and I'm just doing my thing and, I have, um, in my drawer, there was a little dish that my grandmother had had, um, like in her house. And so I, I just kept it, you know, she didn't have a lot of things. So I kept a couple of her things that reminded me of her, but the, I looked at the dish and I just keep like change in there. Didn't mm -hmm. even really think about it. And then the Lord just put on my head, you know, that's a ceremonial bowl. I forgot wow. like this little dish was a 24 karat gold dish that my grandmother would have in her little Buddhist temple. Cause my, my other grandmother on the other side of my, my mom's side, she yeah. was Buddhist. Wow. And so I was like, Oh my gosh, I have like literally an abomination, something that was serving idols. Right, like right. that's I just threw it out. I said, Oh my gosh, God, I'm so sorry that, you know, I, was, I can remember my grandmother. I can look at her picture. I don't need a ceremonial Buddhist bowl to remind me of my grandmother, right, right. you know? And um, so that just shows you like how we're all in a work in progress, how the Lord will, he, you know, it might not be overnight where you're just like getting rid of everything in your house. Mm -hmm. Slowly he's like, the okay, process. he reveals that in conviction. Oh my goodness. I didn't realize that. Right. It's just so cool how he, yeah, how he leads us gently. Right. You know? Right. 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 So, uh, what were the, the generational curses and what does that mean? Okay, so my grandfather was involved in Scientology mm -hmm. and he and he taught me how to astral project and my brother and I witnessed a UFO when we were in high school and I believe all of that was um, tied in with my grandfather's dabblings. So what my grandfather did when, when he would move up the ranks in Scientology, he had to sign paperwork so anybody out there any of your listeners who are in scientology you know what i'm talking about um when you first sign up they they give you a stack i'm not kidding you about four or five inches thick of documents that you sign and wow. i know this because my husband is an actor and he was introduced to scientology and they tried to woo him into it mm -hmm. so my grandfather never told me about this stack but i learned about it because my my husband actually had experience with it he went out to la and you know, we went to a party and they were really wanting him to join this church and um, they wanted him to sign all this stuff. And he said, listen, I'm not going to sign something I'm not reading. I don't, I won't do that. Mm. Just, she just doesn't believe in that. So let me take it home and read it. I mean, I'll look it over and see. And they said, oh, no, you know, 
we want you to sign it today. So they took half the stack out and they said, will you feel more comfortable? And he goes, no. Um, and then they took another half out. So it was like, you know, one inch instead of four. Um, and he was like, no, I, I'm, I want to, no, now I'm so creeped out because I don't understand if you even know what you took out. I mean, if I just sign the end of it, that's, you're going to say that I, I read the whole thing. He's like, no, this is so shady. I'm not, I'm not having any part of it. So basically, um, you don't know what they, what is written in that contract. And just so right. you know that the devil's a legalist. So right. you, you basically sign the rights to your, your family lineage, you, you know, being oppressed, you know, so whatever, um, doors your grandfather has opened up, now those doors are open to you. And it's, it's flowing down that bloodline, whether you like it or not. Mm-hmm. You can't help what your people did before you, you know, but that's the truth. So, um, anyway, uh, it affected me and my brother because those doors were opened and the powers, like when we did dabble with the occult, it was very strong because my grandfather had opened those doors. Right, right. And I just want the listeners to know that Scientology is more than just a, a money <laughs> hungry cult. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. It is completely 100% from the pits of hell. Um, I've done some research on it and Elgon Hubbard was an admirer of uh, a Lester Crowley and he was like one of the like most notorious Satanists and even Elgon Hubbard's one of his sons um, he said in an interview that that his dad was like involved with the satanic powers so you know if the root of of a religion or a cult is bad then the whole then all of it's bad, you know. Yeah. So oh, yeah. yeah, I'm pretty sure if you if you get involved in that in that cult, you're just opening up a lot of doors to the enemy into your life. Sure. Yeah. So um yeah, so can you share the the spiritual side of of the stripper and and model industry? Like, um, like what's going on behind the scenes, like spiritually, or, or what, what do they believe in? Like, what's their what's their faith? Well, so every stripper is their own independent contractor. They're their own person. So we don't know why a person walks into the environment and what their, what their background is. And I'll gotta say that from my experience and years of doing that, because I did it for 12 years, um, I never met a happy stripper. Mm. Never met a happy stripper. Everybody does that job for a reason. And usually, um, there's one of two things that I notice a common theme for women is either they did not have a father involved in their life at all, mm. or they're, they were sexually abused or wow. both. Usually it was both. So nobody walks into that job, um, healthy. You know, if a girl is, is that desperate where she is going into that environment for a live, to make a living, to, you know, um, it's not, she's not healthy. And, um, it's so sad to me because it's very soul sucking. You feel when you're a dancer, you just feel so empty. At first, it, it's kind, it's fun, and you're making great money, and you and you are dressed up like a Barbie. My favorite part was dressing up and being glamorous. I just mm-hmm. didn't want to be average. That really bothered me. I was like, you know, I waitressed, I worked as a bagger, I was a, a struggling college student. So mm-hmm. to me, to dress up like you know. And I did a lot of acting in high school. You know, mm-hmm. I did a lot of co- contests and competitions. So, to, you know, I, and I did a lot of beauty contests. So it was a combination of that. It was like the beauty contest and the acting. I could pretend like I was something or somebody. I could become somebody, in, you know, and then make money at the same time. And I used to joke about this. Um, I just would say that I was a faux ho. I wasn't really a ho. I just look like a hoe, dress like a hoe, but I'm a faux hoe. <laughs> I <laughs> never heard so, that term before. <laughs> anyway, that was like my, my joke. And that was like my loophole because, you know, I enjoyed dressing up and I enjoyed playing a character. And I felt like, why can't, you know, unfortunately, I wasn't blessed in the traditional sense of I wasn't good at math and I wasn't good at a lot of the stuff that could make me good money and get me a good job. You know, even for me to go to college, I was still not sure what I wanted to do. But here I was, you know, a bagger, uh, you know, 
at Jewel that now I'm on stage making thousands of dollars a night mm. and people are coming in just to see me. It was insane. So um, at first, yeah, it's fun. You're, you're making great money. But then after a while, you see what people do to make even more money in this business. You see, you know, the little witchcraft stuff. You see stuff going on in the back room, people compromising themselves. And it really made me sick. I was like, that is not going to happen. It just, to me, it was very sad, lonely existence. And it's very hard to make friends there because you can't trust anyone. People are really just out for themselves. The dancers are, the management is. So you, you know, it's, you just don't really tell people too much information because they'll use that against you. It's, even if you have a boyfriend, you can, a lot of times you can't even tell your friends because they'll tell the customers. So it's a really very lonely existence. Mm-hmm. And, um, so here's, here's a Bible verse that really kind of reflects what it's like to be a dancer. Mm-hmm. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your vision is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your vision is poor, your whole body will be full of darkness. If the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Mm -hmm. When I read that verse, it just struck me like a chord because every day felt like a rainy day. Every day of my life when I was a dancer, there was no good day. Okay. Um, Looking back, did you notice any? anything uh supernatural going on no just not really just like i was saying like yeah. it was just that heavy blanket of depression and hopelessness but the crazy part was everyone else in my circle my my friends quote unquote the people that i worked with they were all on the same level they were all dealing with anxiety all dealing with depression all couldn't sleep and you know so I just felt like, well, I guess this is how life is. Man, yeah. life really sucks for everybody. You know, like, it's just really, the world is very dark. Yeah. Because that's what, I surrounded myself with people who were in the same same boat as me. Mm. Now, here's a, a question that I, I'm very curious about because I've done, um, I try to evangelize um, in different places, even not outside of a strip club. Mm-hmm. And it just seems like the guys walking inside the strip club have just this one track mind. It's like, uh-huh. it's like something's over them. So I don't know. But did you notice like men under a demonic trance? When, when, oh my yeah. gosh. Everyone in the strip club is in a trance. Yes. If you pay attention to the eyes. So this is the really interesting part. I danced the whole time I danced. I was sober. I can't, I never, I don't think I even had one drink the whole time I danced because I didn't want anything to be in. I did not want to be inebriated in any way because I saw what happened when people were. And I was like, no one's going to do or touch me or try and take advantage of me in any way. Mm -hmm. But, um, yes. So you pay attention to the eyes. No stripper. If, if you go in and watch the strippers and I know that some of your listeners can know what I'm talking about. You go in a strip club. I want you next time you walk into a strip club, because I know some of you are still going to go anyway. <laughs> um, and just look, no stripper is ever in the moment. If, if she's getting a dance, she's looking around for where her next dollar is coming from or who's making more money or how she can work a customer to spend more. The wheels are always turning. Unless maybe someone is paying her to get wasted in the VIP, and then maybe she might relax a little. But she's under the spirit of greed, and then she has got anxiety with that. So you see yeah. them, they're just anxious to just, okay, I got to move it, I got to move it, I got to be a hustler is what the words, you know, what they say. Yeah. And then many of the customers, they lie, they cheat on their wives, they spend money they don't have just to fulfill like an immediate desire. They can't even make a logical choice because they're allowing that spirit of lust to rule. Yeah. And then a lot of people are just so wasted. Though to do that, sometimes they have to get wasted first. And so of course the spirit's there. So it's just all around just yeah, everyone's in a little haze of something. Wow. Um do you believe that the women were under a, a spirit, like a like a manipulative, perhaps a Jezebel spirit? Yeah. So, you know, I was just explaining how she's kind of like plotting to see how she's going to make her next buck and right. who's, who's making more money. So a, a stripper is never in the moment. She's always thinking about when her next money's coming from, when's mm-hmm. her next high, you know, the money, the money. It's all about the money. So, yeah, so anyone who... Who's been to a strip club understands what I'm about to say. I, I really want you to pay attention. 
consider a stripper's expression as she approaches your table for a dance. Or if you've been to one, if you could just go back in your memory and just remember that experience of, did this girl give you a wide smile and a seductive look? And so now I want you guys to think about what happened when you denied her a dance. Did her expression change? Did she just roll her eyes or snicker about you or made it make a joke about you and then just walk away? You know, like sometimes people think uh, Jezebel, Je- Jezebel is not that subtle. Jezebel mm. is not that subtle. Yeah. When she doesn't get what she wants, her true self shows. Right. You make her angry and that ugly side comes out real fast. Right. And you will see that. The girls in the club, you will see that. They'll act sweet as pie. But then when you don't give them the money or you're not tipping them enough, the other side comes out. And that's typical Jezebel spirit right there. Right, right. And uh I've come across that spirit when praying for deliverance for people. And that's like one of the harder spirits to cast out for whatever reason. Um, well, that's because it's not a... I don't believe Jezebel is a root spirit. Hmm. So usually Jezebel gets in... Yeah. After another spirit. And I believe the biggest for strippers, the number one reason why the root cause for the girls to be in the club is rejection. Rejection. Because oh. I really want you to think about this. Why would a girl take off her clothes in public? Like literally, you're basically publicly humiliating yourself. Mm-hmm. Yes, it's in a dark light and all this stuff, but think about it. You're vulnerable. You're standing there on stage. You know, air is going into places it shouldn't go. Why would somebody do that? You know, unless they're so needy for approval. Think about it. Pay attention to me. Pay attention. I'll take my clothes off. Pay attention. (laughs) That's basically what it is. It's a, it's, it's a cry. And I hate to say it, but it's a very desperate cry for attention. But why would someone be that desperate? Because they've been rejected. Mm. So a lot of times people who've been rejected, rejected by their own fathers who weren't there for them, didn't care about them, didn't love them, rejected by a boyfriend, rejected by someone they loved and didn't get love in return. Right. So here they are trying to make up for that. And so Jezebel just takes advantage of that. So once that spirit of rejection opens up the door, Jezebel goes right in. You know, mm-hmm. she just weasels her way in. I, You know, why don't you just... You know, pride goes in there too. Why don't you get up on stage? You'll be a superstar, you know? So the pride says that. And then Jezebel's like, yeah, you know, and then you can manipulate customers and make them more money. (laughs) And so here's the, here's a little troop of demons all working together, you know? But I don't believe she's the, so when you're trying to cast out Jezebel, just remember, usually before her, there's a, there's pride and, and before pride, there's rejection. I think mm. that's just from my experience, but you know. Okay. Um, how did the enemy, uh, weave in his way into your life and what ways did he plant snares to trip you up? Cause I, I know in my personal life, like looking back, that was the enemy that planted those snares for me because, you know, I didn't grow up in any kind of, uh, church or anything like that. I didn't even have any Christian mentors. So I didn't, I didn't know about, you know, all this spiritual warfare stuff. I think every time a person comes, comes to Christ, that's when the enemy is like, oh man, we, we gotta, we gotta trip this person up so he cannot, he or she cannot, you know, become very close to God and produce good fruits for his kingdom. Right. And, and they know, they know all your weaknesses. They know all your, you know, all the temptations that you will fall into. So they will attack accordingly. Yeah. So, yeah. So, like, how did the enemy, like, weave his way into your life? <sighs> I, You know, he tricked me because he made me feel like I was in control. Mm. Like, I was the one who had power. But the truth was I was really giving my power away, you know? Yeah. Um, I was entrapped. Um, you give your po- When you take your own clothes off, you're giving your own power away. I don't care what you say. You're giving your integrity away because if you have integrity or if you have intelligence, People aren't seeing that, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. you're not giving them a chance to see that. So mm-hmm. you're, you're basically giving your power away. And I was in trap because to maintain this perceived control that I had over men, I wasn't allowed to age. I wasn't allowed to gain weight. It was just an endless cycle of perfectionism that no one can uh, live up to. So even though it was appealing to me at first to keep that game going, it drained me. So every day became a torment for me. I could... Never enjoy the moment because I always worried about tomorrow. I feel like the enemy, to answer your question of how he tricked me, 
was I, by nature, I'm a, I'm a girl's girl. Like I love being a girl. It's <laughs> almost too much. So you, you know, you put me in a room with makeup and hair and clothes and I love doing the photo shoot. So pride, you know, vanity. I mean, yeah. so though I was easy for him. You just throw a little dangly, shiny thing and uh, tell me I can go shopping. I'm simple. I'm a simple <laughs> girl. You know, I just yeah. grew up poor, you yeah. know, and took advantage of the fact that I was the o- oldest of five kids in my family. My parents had, my dad was a mechanic. We actually had no money. We never went on vacations, never did anything. Mm-hmm. And so I just saw my life as this like, oh my gosh. I'm going to live my whole life and just in, in mediocrity. Like, I feel like inside of me, I've got something like superstar in me. Like, right. you know, so when this opportunity, you know, came along, I was like, heck yeah. You know, <laughs> I just, I'm not a bad person. I love to dress up, you know, so he took advantage of my already fleshy ways. That's yeah. my tendency is to, to be that, you know, that girly girl and said, look at, you'll be the ultimate woman. If you're in playboy, you know, you'll be the, the number one girl, you know, if you're in this magazine. So that's how he did it for me. Right. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Okay. Um, so like, how did you come to repentance and what did it mean to repent? Oh my gosh. So this is crazy. When I was going through this whole thing, um, I felt like I was going to die. And I I know this sounds crazy, but I felt like death was on me because every bone in my body was aching. I didn't know this at the time, but I had gotten osteoporosis. There's a wow. Bible verse, and I don't have it up here right now, but um, it talks about um, if David was lamenting, and he was saying, my bones, um, they ache from my sin. And when I read that, I knew when I found out I had osteoporosis, that was me. So because of my sinful lifestyle, because of, you know, the late nights and drinking caffeine and not getting enough sleep and not eating enough calories, what I had done and not getting enough sunlight because I worked a night job. So I never saw the sun. And so here I, here I was, this night owl, very selfish person living for myself and, you know, and, um, and I was feeling it in my body. So at 33, I ended up getting like osteoporosis, but I didn't know what it was. I was just hurting. and. Um, I told my husband, we were driving down the street, and I said, you know what? I feel in my bones I'm not going to live much longer. I just feel like my time is, is going to be coming closer to the end. And he goes, what are you talking about? You're so, you're 33. You're not, you're not going to die. And I just felt like death was pressing in on me. And I was like, listen, I just feel like that. And I felt like God put in my heart right at that moment. Yeah, you don't really have a lot of time. So either you jump on, you, you jump on the boat, or you jump off, but you need mm. to make a choice. You you cannot serve right. two masters. Like I was trying to toe the line. I was trying to keep my job because I didn't want my husband to leave me. You know, because we had because I, I was making so much money, and I thought he he wouldn't be able to handle like going down to nothing. Compa- right. You know. So right. anyway, I was just like in a real torment. Like oh my gosh, and I felt like the Lord's like, yeah, you don't have a lot of time. I so I just said, you know what? If I'm gonna die. I might as well just go all in. I've never given God and, and live for him. I'm just going to see what happens and just be risky here. So I felt like he was telling me there's this is your last chance. You're either with me or against me. So I told my husband, who I was very in love with, that I had to choose God. Mm-hmm. And I was quitting my job. And I knew he didn't believe in Jesus and if he wanted to leave me, I understood. And I, I kid you not, this was the hardest thing I ever did because it, we did, we had a good relationship. So right. I thought, you know, I'm throwing away the most amazing person because I'm doing this for you, God. You know, like, I'm going to really go all in. And that was really scary for me. Wow. wow. But repentance means to totally go the opposite direction. So Sorry to answer your yeah, question. Right. Um, so repentance means not just I'm sorry. But walking that out, when you say you're sorry for someone, you you turn the other direction. Mm, yeah. So I said, I'm leaving, you know, I'm leaving my job. And he goes, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know. I, I haven't done anything my whole life. Like, I've only been a dancer and a model, so I'm quitting it all. And I felt the Lord say, walk away from your locker. I had thousands and thousands of dollars of clothes and jewelry. I mean, I'm not even kidding you. 
thousands. I had wow. every single dress had a matching garter, had matching, you know, panties and, and, and had jewelry, like bracelet and earrings for each one. I mean, it was crazy. My, my, I, I don't even know how much money was in that locker. And I just mm -hmm. like, okay, I'm going to just walk away from it all. And I didn't talk to any girl. Um, I just left. Like it was just, I was disappeared. Yeah. Yeah. I remember when, um, when I, when I turned back to God, um, I, you just have this sorrow because you grieved them. And, uh, yeah. you just want to, you just feel, it's hard to put it into words, but when you, when you grieve God and you realize that, you know, all your life you've just been selfish and not really living for Him, and He yeah. created you for Him, you know, that, that's, and when you turn away from from all the things that that's not pleasing to him, I think that's real genuine repentance. Like when you know in, know in your heart that you're wrong and that you want to live totally for him, that that's a sign of repentance to me. Yes, yeah, yeah, I yeah. agree totally. Yeah. Okay, so here's here's a controversial uh, question. Okay. Um, do you believe you were still a Christian or saved, even though you were living in sin? Cause I know well, there's... Yeah, we, yeah. I, I talk about this to my husband all the time. This is something we kind of go back and forth on. So, you know, I believe I had the seed of Christ in me. So mm -hmm. I asked Jesus in my heart when I was four years old. Mm -hmm. I don't think I really understood what, what salvation was. You know, what Jesus died on the cross to save me from. I didn't understand sin quite fully at that time. Um, so, and I was not watering that seed, you know, when I was living in sin and I was not watering that seed and therefore by default, I had no fruit. So there was a Bible verse that says you will know them by their fruit. Mm -hmm. Um, so here it is right here by their fruit. You will recognize them. Do people pick, pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear good bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. So I had no good fruit in my life, none. Mm -hmm. And so when I read that verse, I I had real conviction. I felt like, you know what? I'm probably not saved because there's no evidence that Christ lives in me. Mm -hmm. I think I had a seed, and I never watered it, so yeah. it died. You know, and so I felt like I needed to get saved. So I asked Jesus <laughs> in my heart all over again, yeah. and um. You know, here, here's another Bible verse. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. So here I was a young little child, four years old. I got saved, didn't really understand salvation and grace and all of that. Um, and then I allowed the world to, to throw in some confusion. And then I was like, Oh, I don't really know where I'm going to go. And there, there you go. I feel like that was him trying to like snatch away what the Lord had given me. Mm. But I believe too that my mom's prayers reactivated that seed of Christ inside of me. So God pursued me. God, you know, my mom kept praying and praying and praying and she would call me and it was so horrible to her. Jamal, I was horrible. Mm -hmm. She would call me. She would give me like, I don't know how many nativity scenes every Christmas. And I was so mean about it. Like, Stop sending me nativity scene. <laughs> well, because yeah. also I'm a minimalist and I just don't like a lot of junky stuff. So I was like, "Cause you just send me a picture of it." <laughs> but but aside from that, it was like, oh my gosh, she was giving me Bibles and she was always telling me she'd pray for me. And the bad thing was, every single time she called me to say that she was praying for me, horrible things were happening in my life. So I would get really angry at my mom, like. Stop praying for me because whenever you say you're praying for me, so many bad things start happening. Wow. So it's amazing because you know God's God's breaking down some of the stuff that Satan wants to build his kingdom in your life. Yeah. He would he would love for me to be successful. He wanted to be me to be on the cover of Playboy. He wanted to be to be on these things because right. that would further entrap me. Right. So my mom's getting the answer to her prayers. It's breaking down Satan's kingdom, and that right. wasn't making me happy when I was living you know, for myself. So here's a, a Bible verse that I think really is awesome. And I love it. Um, the prayer of a righteous man has the power to prevail. Mm -hmm. And I love this other one that says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline or lose heart when he rebukes you 
For the Lord disciplines the ones he loves, and he chastens everyone he receives as a son. Endure suffering as discipline. God is training you as sons. For who, what son is not disciplined by his father? And then there's one more verse I'm going to read. Knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. So Amen. I believed when so many things had happened to me. I lost. So I was supposed to be um, on the Mardi Gras Playboy issue, mm-hmm. and that didn't work out. I felt like um, I was also supposed to be a Maxim, and then I and, and a tragedy happened, and I broke my finger, and I had this huge cast on my middle finger, and they couldn't shoot me. And all these things, like as soon as I started to get gain success, my mom would call and say, I'm praying for you. And then I'd lose the jobs. You know, I'd lose this Playboy job. I lost this Maxim job. Wow. And I was like, you know, but you know what? That was God chasing me. He did not want me to be, to be that girl. And he didn't want my name and my image to be associated with that kind of stuff. So, um, the goodness of God is that I didn't have success in the worldly sense of the world word, you know, um, I'm glad that didn't happen for me because I'm so much happier, way happier now as a housewife, working from home, writing books. Like I would have never dreamed in a million years that I would be happy doing laundry and not being on stage and wearing all these glamorous clothes. You wouldn't have, mm-hmm. I just would never have imagined that. So right. maybe. yeah, I just want to, you know, with the listeners to know that there's power in interceding for others for praying for others. I mean, your mom, she probably, I don't know, by her prayer, she probably saved your life. Oh my, I know she did. Oh, yeah. I believe that was my full heart. And I thank yeah. her all the time. I'm like, thank you for, for putting up with me. She's the, she to me is the epitome of unconditional love because awesome. she put up with so much and she continued to love me. And I don't know anyone in my life who's ever been that way. To, except for my husband and he's pretty much like that too but you know my mom I mean I yelled at her I it was just I was horrible to her yeah. and um she did not deserve it and you know I just feel like um our people like that are on the on the on Satan's hit list you know these precious people that love to pray that love their children you know not because they're good but because because they just love them yeah. and mm-hmm. and um I think that they're on the front lines. We just need to keep lifting those mothers up that are, are their, their kids are on the street. They're doing things that they, they know are not right. And, and they're afraid for their salvation. I think right. that, you know, mom, mom's prayers are keeping them alive. Right. Right. So just to all the Christians out there who are listening, continue to pray for others, continue to pray mm-hmm. for the salvation of others. And, um, God may not answer the prayer right away, but, you know, Jesus said, you know, continue to pray. Don't give up. So right. don't ever give up praying. Continue to pray for others. Um, something is happening in the spirit realm when you, when you pray. So don't ever give up with that. Um, okay. what was the process or the, the method for, for deliverance? Uh, you know, so I, I hopped from church to church and I had a hand laid on me and I got some to, deliverance from a, a man on the phone I was just like you know I, I it was really crazy I didn't I didn't go to a church that acknowledged um demonic well I wasn't going to church at all mm-hmm. but it was very hard for me when I had this issue because now all of a sudden I had to find a church yeah. and then I had to find a church that believed in deliverance <laughs> and that is so hard to do especially in Chicago so yeah. I, I found, um, little tiny places like on the south side, on the west side, really bad neighborhoods that were really scary. And, and a lot of them were prosperity driven. So these, these pastors, it's unfortunate. My experience of this has been very unfortunate that a lot of these people who understand deliverance, they also understand the power of the tithe and they push you to do that. And I just think it is such a tragedy that people are being pushed away or discouraged or or feeling like if they don't pay up that they're that God's not going to answer or deliver them. You yeah, know what I'm saying? Amen, yeah. I don't believe money should change hands. I don't believe money should be ever in the conversation. If a deliverance minister is charging anything, mm-hmm. this person is not anointed of God. And un- I and I also know that I had hands laid on me and I did get delivered at some of these places. You know why? 
because God wanted me delivered. Mm -hmm. And because he's, he, you know how there's a Bible verse that says, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. You know, you cast out devils, but Lord, we cast out devils in your name. We did this in your name. He says, depart from me. I never knew you. So I believe there's a lot of people out there who are in deliverance ministry. They are actually casting out demons that will not end up in heaven because they serve another God. And it is the God of greed. And so that has been my experience of it. It's just tragic that a lot of people are not getting help because they see these shady preachers in there and say, well, this is a scam, you know. Something in your gut says that can't be right. So... Anyway. Yeah, yeah, awesome. So, so what resources did you use? Well, I, I read if the any. Bible <laughs> and I read, I read the um, book called, uh, Pig in the Parlor, The Pig in the Parlor. That oh, helped a lot. Frank and, Hammond, and that, right? Yeah. I'm sorry? Is it by Frank Hammond? Yes. yes it's an yes. excellent book. And yeah. that was like, somebody gave it to me. I don't know who it was, but somebody got it in my hands and I was like, I couldn't believe it because I'm like, yes, this person knows what I'm going through because <laughs> yeah. nobody knew what I was talking about, like in the natural, you know, and then even churches, people would look at me weird. I mean, I go to the front of the, of to the prayer line, you know, just get pray. Just, I, I, it was like a desperate person searching in the desert, searching for water. I would just go out for prayer. Any chance I get, please, please pray for me. And one time I remember I was in this church, pray for me. She goes, what's your request, honey? I said, cast out these demons and then all of a sudden I just start manifesting and she's like her eyes just got huge and she was like oh what do I do and I'm like foaming at the mouth and I'm flopping on the floor now and it's just it was just horrible but I mean that's how desperate I was I just just go and just get hands laid on me any chance I get wow so what was like the length of time for you to be completely delivered so It took about two years, and I don't want to say that to scare people, but I believe the Lord took a little bit longer with me because he wanted me to understand deliverance so I can Mm -hmm. write my book and share my experience and teach others the process of it because it's not just casting out spirits. It's going through the process of repentance, Right. and sometimes repentance takes time for you to truly understand how you offended God and really... um, come into agreement with him and his word. And so the Lord was slow, like changing me, really changing my heart. I was saturating in the word and I was really like getting an understanding of how I, what I've done and all the abominations, the little things I did all along the way, a little tarot cards here, a little Santeria there, a little stripping here, a little Mm -hmm. playboy there. All these things were adding up. And then, you know, and I had to see what, wow, wow, wow. So it took time. And, you know, during that process, the Lord led, gave me the strength to fast, you right. know, fast and, and pray. Like I fasted media for two years. I did not watch television. I did not awesome. watch radio because, he, you know, I wanted to hear his voice. And he he taught me, you know, when I read the word, he, the word came alive and he taught me what I needed to work on and focus on. It. And that was 100 percent my focus. Yeah. And just, I just want the listeners to know that tarot cards and all, and Santeria, all of that will just roll the red carpet out for the, for the enemy to come inside your body or into your life. So stay away from anything that's divination or the occult or, or the new age. Yeah. yeah. You know what's sad is that you look on any magazine and they're, they're just promoting this stuff like crazy. And a lot of kids are like so into that. You know, Illuminati third eye, and they're yeah. throwing up their hands, and they're pre- they're painting these, putting tattoos. They don't even know what they're putting on their body, right. and they're giving a salutation and a salute to to something that's really going to oppress them. They're at you know, and they're marking themselves in, and oppressing themselves, and it's so sad because this is the culture that we live in. This is our culture is telling us this is cool, this is this is hot, yeah. and um. So to, to stand up for God and to, to say, I don't want to do that. A lot of kids are afraid. Like, well, all my friends are doing Charlie, Charlie now. There's some, mm. some other spirit, some other weird game. That's yeah. kind of like the Ouija board. Mm-hmm. That's like the hip new thing now. So all my friends are doing it and I'll feel weird if I don't do it. So I, I just want to encourage all of you kids out there. You know, there's so the devil is promoting rebellion, but I say, if you're going to be a rebel, 
rebel against someone forcing you to do something you don't feel comfortable with. Okay, that's not cool. Why don't you just turn the tables on them and say, listen, dude, if you guys want to do that, that's cool with you. How about you just give me the chance to make my own decisions? I'm not just going to do it because you are all doing it. I'm going to do my own thing. And watch and see them respect you for standing up for yourself. There's something to be said for a leader, a kid who would just stand up to his friends and say, I don't think that's cool. I'm going to do something else. If You could flippantly not make it a big deal or make it a big deal. But, but anybody that stands up for themselves, I, in my head, consider that a leader. You don't want to be a follower and just follow everything everyone's doing. You know, mm-hmm. stand up, you yeah. know, and if it, if it sets you apart from the crowd, I mean, isn't that what kids want to do anyway? They're all doing these weird things. They're dyeing their hair like rainbow. Why? Why are they doing that? To stand out from the crowd. Well, how about you stand up for yourself on something you really feel strong about? How right. about you do that? Instead right. of, you know, all the other crazy things that you're willing to do. You're willing to put, put you know, nine tattoos on you know or piercings on your face and right. but you won't but you won't stand up to your friends that's crazy that, mm-hmm. that's just lunacy to me but yeah. i just want to encourage the kids out there be cool and be a leader just if you don't want to do it don't do it if, you, if your gut's telling you stay away go with your gut always go with that right 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 amen so what did you do or didn't do to keep your your deliverance you know I understand how deliverance works, so it's not such a scary thing. You yeah. know, it's something that I think every Christian should do on a regular basis. It's mostly about staying in tune with the Holy Spirit through regular, honest repentance. You know, if you recognize a stronghold, be quick about routing that out. You know, sometimes you don't have the faith to pray properly over yourself, and that's where getting humble and asking others to pray in agreement with you is really important. And so I'm just going to throw this Bible verse out there. Is any one of you sick? He should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick. The Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. And one little point I'd like to make is that he should call the elders of the church. If your church does not believe in this, that's okay. You have an elder in the Lord. Because the church is actually the body of Christ. So if you have a friend or somebody, a mentor, or somebody who knows the Lord a little more than you, have them anoint you you with oil and pray over you. And, you know, this is important, that we need each other in the body of Christ. This is not something that we should be doing on our own. We need each other. So be there for your friends and have your friends be there for you because it's it's tough to do the spiritual warfare thing on your own. Right, right, right. Now, uh, this question is um, something I'm wondering about because I know a lot of churches are just being deceived when it comes to uh, spiritual warfare. Um, I, I went through a lot of demonic attacks and I went to a lot of churches to get help and they just didn't know what to do. They, they really didn't know what to do. And I'm like, wow, you guys know the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Yeah. You don't know about spiritual warfare. You, you should, you should have the answers for me, but, right, but they, right. didn't, they didn't have any answers. Um, and I think that's, that's pretty sad, but I, you know, I love them. They're, they're, they're brothers and sisters in Christ, but it just a lot of, a lot of Christians are just, they just have no clue. Um, but in what way do you believe that enemy is deceiving the churches, especially when it comes to deliverance and spiritual warfare? You know, I think he's doing it through intimidation. Mm-hmm. So I believe that deliverance has been presented in such an unbalanced way that many preachers have really shied away from it. You know, something in their spirits is saying that something isn't right. You know, perhaps they have seen something that was done that wasn't decent or in order, or in their minds it's just better not to open up that scary can of worms. So for me, it's unfortunate because people really need to know how the enemy works so they can prepare for and fight their own battles. There isn't a demon behind every sin. And if you find yourself unusually oppressed in an area, it's most likely a stronghold that the enemy is exploiting. And and continual sins, they build strongholds. So people need to take responsibility for their part in their oppression. Because a demon just can't just land in your life. 
he has to have a reason to be there, you know? Mm -hmm. Many deliverance ministries kind of blame everything on demons, you Mm -hmm. know? And so I think a lot of times people see that and they go, well, no, you know that that person has to have some responsibility. So Mm -hmm. it's also very overwhelming and discouraging, and it makes a person feel helpless if they feel like they can get attacked all the time at any moment by demon spirits, you know? Um, if that's not right either, that's a wrong teaching. Demons have to have a right, a reason to be there. You have to open up a door for them to be there. Yeah. So the cool thing is that God has given us power. So we must recognize the enemy's lies and how we've come into agreement with those lies. And we must not give in but stand strong and get educated and fight back. And so the church should be an educational experience. We should be learning tactics of the enemy and learning how to defend ourselves. And instead of making it seem so scary, just matter of fact, we're in a war. I mean, you look at the news and my God, how could anyone, even a non-believer say we're not in a war? Something weird is going on in the world all around us. We're seeing just wickedness everywhere. So um, to prepare for that, to prepare for wickedness and coming into your life and your family, I don't understand why um, churches don't want to educate people on that (laughs) a little bit stronger. and. And, yeah. But anyway, yeah. that's just me. I mean, I understand how you feel because I, I went through that too, and it was just really discouraging. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, so, like, what tools do you suggest churches need to deal with the issue of deliverance or, or demonized people? Uh, I just think it'd be wonderful to see a staff that's able to recognize when someone is oppressed. Yeah. And and how to know how to take authority over those spirits, you know, Mm. um, praying regularly with the same people is really powerful because then you'll begin to see the needs and you'll recognize when your friend has a stronghold and, um, small groups are great because then you can get your prayer needs met and and have accountability partners. So, you know, I don't believe in airing your dirty laundry for just anyone, you know, that you would have discernment. Okay, Lord, which believer is the one that I can share this really touchy stuff with. Mm-hmm. And um, and also I feel like Christians need to be really, really sensitive to, to the Holy Spirit and not repeating things. If someone shares something really close to them, God has entrusted you with that. And that you bring it to the Lord in prayer or you check in on that person, on their accountability, but you don't breathe a word of it to anyone else. Because they could literally walk away from the Lord because of you opening up your mouth or you not respecting um, the things that they've shared with you. Um, so anyway, like I'm just going to read a couple Bible verses. Sure. Go ahead. Um, so you and I both experience freedom. So we, for you were called to freedom brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another for the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And that verse is kind of what I was talking about with um, respecting people's prayer requests. A lot of times I just see a lot of gossipy people in churches. Yes. They share Someone shares a request and then someone will use it as an opportunity of the flesh because they just want to get out that juicy bit. Mm-hmm. But we're supposed to yeah. love one another each other and serve right, one another. Right. And maybe that's just shutting your mouth. Maybe that's serving God, shutting your mouth. So um, I feel really strong about that because to me, prayer requests are so precious. They're so holy. They're so amazing. And um, it's just you, people, I don't think, understand how, what an abomination it is to, to speak that in a gossipy way and repeat yeah, that. Yeah. Um, and so then there's another verse. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. So we should be looking out for each other in every Amen. way Amen. to make sure that we don't offend a brother or sister by, by doing those things and, and making sure we encourage them that they're struggling in a certain area, checking in on them, stuff like that. Amen. Awesome. So what did you learn throughout the whole process of deliverance and, you know, wrestling with the enemy and the, and the vain things of the world? Man, it's so weird. It's so crazy, Jamal, because in this life we value status, riches, and power. But God values the exact opposite, the Mm. things of the heart, things like loyalty and love and forgiveness and holiness and repentance. You know, what God values really is the stuff of substance. It builds character. It's eternal. 
and everything the world values has no stability and it can be lost. You know, it makes no eternal difference whether you are rich or powerful in this life. None of that matters. Um, I, I've known people that um, are very powerful and rich and they perished and they've died. And I've known people who love the Lord and they didn't have any money and they had a smile on their face when they passed. Wow. And, um, you know, so it's like to see the difference. If we were to look, um, like, I feel like this experience has really opened my eyes to see life from God's perspective mm. and to see life backwards. Like I want to live a life that, that was full of the right things, wow. full of the right choices. Cause I've made so many bad choices and I already know where that leads. I've already gone down that road. It's not fulfilling. It's not fun. There's not, there's, it's just not. And all, I'm just going to encourage your listeners. If you're on that bad road and you know what it is, just, to most degrees, I mean, I'm sure you're enjoying sin for a little bit, but you got to say that it's just not filling you up. And, you, and if you keep doing it and your whole life is around that, at some point, you know, you just, you're going to have to go at some point. We're all going to go at some point. And um, I think that if this life is so short to just live knowing that it's short, let's take advantage of this time that God's given us. Right. Awesome. Yeah. Um, did it make you a, a stronger believer? Cause I know for me, it made me a stronger believer when I was going through what I would call a fiery trial because I was like, Oh my goodness, this is real. The, the devil's real. <laughs> I'm like, wow, I better, you know, choose who, this day who I serve. I'm like, I'm going to, I'm going to choose God like 110%. I'm going all the way for God, you know? Yeah, so, totally. Yeah. Well, you know, I feel like, yes, it does. And when life is good, I always like say this prayer, like, Lord, I am so aware that right now I'm not going through a fire trial. And I almost get nervous. Like, things are so good, God, but I don't want you to leave me just because things are good. And I don't want to come to you just because things are bad. I make sure that prayer is so important to me because I don't want to use God only when things are bad. So yeah. I'm like, Lord, let's stay close. You're blessing me. Things are good right now, but that I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going to just hunker down when things are bad with you. Let's do this all the time, right. you know, because I want God not to feel used. You know, I think about when my friends Amen. have done that to me, they'll call me when nothing else is happening or when they're bored. And I'm just like, oh, I'm just some entertainment for you now that you're <laughs> bored, yeah. you know, and I'm like, that's probably how God feels, you know, and here he is blessing us and things are going great. And we totally forget about him. Like, that's the time when we should be like, thank you, Lord. Right, you know? right, right. And, you know, look at Job. Even despite all all the calamity that fell upon him, he still was faithful to God. He yeah. had that loyalty to God. You know, that's, that's how every Christian should be. Totally. Yeah, and even for me, it's like, no matter what happens to me, I, I have to stick with God because I know there's, you know, there's nothing else out there. It's only Jesus, you know. <laughs> so yeah. Yes, I agree. Right. So, um, did it make you appreciate God's grace or forgiveness more? You know, despite all what you did and how he delivered you, and you know, did it really make you appreciate God more? You know what made me feel like in awe of how deep he loves us? Mm. And, you know, like, I remember... When I was praying one time, I said, God, where were you when I was dancing? Where were you all those years that I was away from you? And he showed me, Jamal, I, I got stories, man. There was times where, when my life was in danger and there was times when like bad things could have happened to me and it didn't. And the Lord just brought those things to my mind during this prayer time. And I was like, Oh my gosh, you were there. So I didn't, you know, things didn't happen to me the way things could have gone down really bad in certain situations and they didn't. Wow. And so there was like one time where I could have swore that I almost got sex trafficked. It was bad. Mm -hmm. And like these, these strip club owners are shady and I work mm -hmm. in. Um, so I tried to work in Las Vegas one time and, and that there was so shady out there it was so dirty out there. I didn't, wow. but um, me and my friends had so many crazy things and God protected me the whole time. And so anyway, I, I said, where were you? And then, you know, he reminded me of these things that I had 
you know, it's like bullets that had passed by me, but didn't hit me. And I was like, Oh my gosh, God, you were there. You were there the whole time. <laughs> I just started weeping. And then, um, he gave me a visual, which was just amazing. I was praying in the spirit and he was, I, I was on the, I was on the stage and I was twirling around the pole like I always did. And I saw this man sitting on the bottom of the stairs and his head was looking down at the floor and he wouldn't look at me. And he was so sad. And of course he was dressed like Jesus. And so, and he had the long hair and, and, wow. and he just looked so sad. And then I heard in my heart, I was waiting for you to be done with yourself. And that just like was wow. amazing to me that God came to, came <laughs> in the strip club, went with me everywhere I was at. His Holy Spirit was around me where that guy said, I knew you wouldn't handle this Santeria stuff because something different about you. I, there's something around you. Some I could just tell. And that was him. His spirit was there. So like it made me realize that God doesn't love us because we're good people. Okay. I was the, the sinner of sinners. Like Paul said, the worst of the worst. I was right. the most selfish person I knew in my life. And God was there with me. So what does that tell you? That God loves us. Mm. It's not about us being good. And that's not anything I heard in church. I grew up in a church that was Southern Baptist that made me feel like if I didn't get right with God right now, that he was going to send me to hell. And, and I deserved it. Mm. And God made me feel like I never wanted to send you to hell. I was looking for every opportunity to save you and be there for you. And that just blew my mind away that God was not only wow. that resilient, but that kind and that, that, that sweet, you know? Wow. Yeah. God's mercy and grace is just mind blowing. It's, it's astounding. It is. It yeah, really is. Yeah. Despite how evil we are, you know, <laughs> in his eyes, like he, he still loves us and he still you know, wants to forgive us. It's, it's, it's just crazy. <laughs> he's the crazy one that's when, when people say like oh you love Jesus you're so weird and crazy I'm like no you know what's crazy Jesus is crazy he loves me he's insane yeah. who would love me you know yeah. I don't I wouldn't I wouldn't pick me out you know but he did and yeah. he did that for each of us and I feel like he's pursuing each of us in our own ways mm -hmm. like he pursued me different than he pursued you Jamal yeah. and he speaks to me different than he speaks to you but you know, I just wish that people would be more hungry for God than they would for the latest fads or to please their friends. Because if they would pursue him just a little bit and get to experience him just a little bit, mm -hmm. you get a taste of God. And I kid you not. It doesn't matter what drink or what drug you've done. Nothing there is compared. no high greater than <laughs> feeling the presence of the Holy Spirit and Amen. in yeah. your room with you. It's just amazing. Yeah, there's nothing in the world that compares to having a close relationship with God. Nothing. Nothing, like, yes. <laughs> nothing, nothing even comes close. Not like, even close, yep. Yeah, and I, and I feel really sad because a lot of people are just missing out, and they don't want to even come close to God or, or Jesus. They just don't want any part of them, and it's really sad. You know, and I understand because I grew up in a very, like, you know, Southern Baptists were all about the rules. And basically, mm -hmm. you know, that was my particular church. And I'm not saying every church, Baptist church is like that. Yeah. But, you know, that's what the Pharisees were like. And that's what Jesus came to say, no, you guys are, you're missing it. It's about a relationship with God. It's not about the rules. Of course, you know, when I, when I actually met Jesus and I fell in love with him, you know what fell away? My sin fell away because I just didn't want to do it anymore. I loved him too much. Mm -hmm. You you love me that much? Oh, how can how can I spit in your face anymore? My God, you just respond in a loving way back, and the sin falls away because it's just it it, it means nothing to you because that relationship you want to keep it. You know, it's a different motivation instead of it being a works and oh my good enough. It's like you love God so much; it's just a natural response of your love for Him. That the sin would just drop away. Right, right, yeah. So, what is your advice to those, you know, partaking in the whole sex stripper modeling industry? And, uh, what can Jesus Christ do for them? Cause I know, or well, I don't know, maybe some stripper or someone thinking about becoming a stripper or getting in, into the whole modeling stripper slash sex industry. 
um, maybe some girl out there is thinking about getting into that. What would you say? Well, um, my heart hurts for you. Like, I'm just thinking about that right now. My heart hurts for you because I know that you're, you're walking in there and you, you're acting all tough and you're all cool and you think you're cool, but there's something deep, deep, deep inside of you that's hurting. And, um, and you may not tell any of your friends or your parents, nobody knows, but there's something deep, deep inside that doesn't feel worthy and doesn't, um, and you're searching. And, um, I, and I know that you can't, um, understand how valuable you are because you can't see it right now, but God mm-hmm. loves you and you're valuable and, um, and taking off your clothes is not going to make you feel more valuable. Mm. It's going to make you feel less valuable. Um, but here's what I have to say that it's such a brave thing to take your clothes off, right? And to burden the shame that comes with that kind of job to survive in that world. It really takes a tough cookie. So in, to me, I think a stripper is a reflection. Like you do have some bravery, you know, something inside of you that's willing to go against the norm. So I encourage like all you brave girls out there to go ahead and be brave, be radical. But I say use that determination for something that really matters. You know, take a big risk, go against the norm. And instead of being bold and risky for yourself, be bold and risky for God. Mm -hmm. Live beyond yourself because it's so empty to live only for yourself. Everyone Like, I, I don't, I hate selfies. I won't take a selfie. I'm just, (laughs) just, I mean, unless my husband's in it with me and we're (laughs) in a place and there's a reason for it, I will not just, you will not see a picture of me taking a selfie. Because so many people are so in love with themselves. And I don't Mm -hmm. feel that, I don't see that as fulfilling. I did that. You know, that was my life. And I'm like, please don't tell me that you love that. You, you know, in your heart that that's not fulfilling you. So why not take a risk? And, and, and look beyond yourself and go live for something greater than yourself, you know, because this vanity lasts for a very short time. And when this life is over and it's going to end for all of us, we all need to be ready to meet our maker. Mm -hmm. And, and so I'm just going to leave with two Bible verses here. So to, so teach us to number our days so that we may get a heart of wisdom. Mm -hmm. Um, and look carefully. Then how you walk, not as the unwise, but as wise, making the best use of time because the days are evil. Mm -hmm. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. So that, that would be what I just have to say is that, you know, your life is more than just having a good time and just, you know, making money. And just being cool, like something in your heart is saying, there's got to be more. And I encourage you to look for that more and to pray for that more. Mm. Yeah. Awesome. Amen to that. Um, yeah. So, you know, like living in sin opens a person up to more sin. I mean, we all experience that. Um, I, I think the the devil is just not satisfied with defiling us in, in one area. Right. Um, when you were in the whole um, stripper um, modeling industry, did you notice your heart um, oh. hardening? Or did yeah. it like, did you like become like bad to worse? So, okay. So when I first started stripping, my, f- okay, this is hilarious. My friends used to joke, they used to call me the Martha Stewart stripper. Because hmm. I really love people. I find them fascinating and interesting. And the more different you are, I just want to know more about you. And so, like, and they, so anyway, I didn't really take advantage of my customers. I respected my customers. I wanted them to respect me, so I respected them. So my one girlfriend said, you know, I had different names, but at this time I was Ariel. Ariel, you are so, such a weird stripper. Because I would give people change. If someone told me he was a sex addict, which has happened a few times, people would say, oh, I'm a sex addict. I'm here on a bender. You know, I just pulled out 700 from the ATM. I look at them and I go, 
oh my gosh, get the hell out of here. <laughs> Excuse my French, but that's what I said. And I would literally push him out the door. And my girlfriend was with me at the time. She goes, are you insane? Why would you do that? And I said, because I have a conscience. This guy's on a bender. We can't do that. We can make money from someone else. Mm. She's like, oh my gosh, what is wrong with you? So there was something inside of me that like, I don't know, uh, was still love people. And, you yeah. know, so I, you know, I was like that for a very long time, still had my personality of caring for people and wanting to make sure I took care of them. But over, I'd say over the years, when I really noticed, and, and I share this in my book, actually, mm-hmm. I noticed this one instance, and I'll never forget it. The song Switchfoot was playing. We were meant to live for so much more. Really stung out to me because that was the song that was playing. And, and I was feeling the words and I was on the stage and I was the last girl on the set. So we were going to close the club and I was the last girl and there was one customer there and he was wasted and he had one dollar. And I was like, so annoyed with him. Like, you are wasting my time. I just want to get home. I'm so tired. My feet are killing me. And this guy's like, here's a dollar, check it out. And I was like, oh my gosh. You know, <laughs> looking at him like, I go, this guy, I mean, does he have any more money in his wallet? What's, he's so pathetic. And I, and I literally said, oh my gosh, I've become a monster. I've become just like one of them. I always said I would never be that person that mm-hmm. would only care about the money. And that would, that would be the only thing. I, o- I always had liked my customers and tried to respect them. And that moment, all I cared about was the money and, and this, and, and I didn't see a man anymore. And I knew like that, that song was singing, we were meant to live for so much more. It just like was ricocheting off my heart. It was so hard. And I was like, what happened to me? What happened to me? What's going on? Where, where is me? I, I lost myself. It was just really weird. So yes, I, it was a, it gradually over time. My heart got a little bit harder and a little bit harder and a little bit harder until I literally looked in the mirror and I'm like, I don't even recognize you anymore. I don't wow. even know who you are anymore. Like I wanted to be a missionary I used to just care about people. And, and I just became so selfish. So yeah, yeah it yeah. happens, but it happens. Sometimes it happens. Boom. But for me, it happened really cra- gradually. Oh, wow. So like while while you were in the industry, like um, at any point did you feel like a strong conviction from God? You're like, oh my goodness, what am what am I doing? Why am I doing this? Did you ever have that that conviction? Yeah, you know what? I'm going to share with you a, a couple stories I have never shared before. This is really interesting. Um, okay, I was in New York with my girlfriend, and um, this was a while ago, but. Um, I'm trying to think, like, how do I start this? So, me and my girlfriends would travel. Sometimes we would get bored, and you know, at our club, and we wanted to be the new girls and make. Sometimes you can make more money as a new girl because you're fresh meat. And, oh, we've never seen her before. Let's check her out. So, and we just love to go on like road trips and and make mm-hmm. good money, and we find out the best clubs and we go to them. And so. My girlfriend's like, I want to go to New York. I hear it's awesome and great money. So we, we rented, um, an apartment in Chelsea and we stayed there for two weeks. And I got hired at, at the time, this was like the nicest strip club. It was called Scores New York. Mm-hmm. And so we go to this place and all the celebrities would go there. And I mean, I can't even tell you how many celebrities I've met that were wanted to date me and wow. all this stuff, but it was crazy. So, and that, and I only worked there, I'd say like, so I had a problem and, and I couldn't go back and I'll tell you what happened. But so I only worked there like maybe four or five, four nights or three nights. And, but I had met a lot of celebrities just even in that short amount of time. So anyway, one night that I was working, um, this guy comes in and he was, he was the owner of the club mm-hmm. and his, uh, he, you could tell he had power because he had all these, people around him Mm -hmm. and that the room kind of got quiet and shut down and they 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 sectioned off the whole one whole section for him and he had like bodyguards with him i didn't know who he was because i'm not a new yorker and i don't really know you know so i'm like okay so he calls me over i go over and he's like really skinny and he's just treating me really strange he's like you know "I, i want you um i really like you and i'm like okay um, he's like, you're going to be my girlfriend. And I'm like, 
all right, buddy, whatever, <laughs> as long as you're paying me. You know, like that's how the stripper says, no, I'm serious. You're going to be my girlfriend. He goes, you know, I always get what I want. So I'm just going to tell you this right now. I own this club. And I'm like, so my ears perk up and I'm like, whoa. I mean, he, he, he had this, the scariest, deadest eyes I've ever seen. Just mm. complete dead. So he's looking at me. He goes, I want you to look me in the eye. He goes, we have your information and I, kn- I know where you live. We have your information. And if you don't do what I say, I'll, I'll come out after your family members. I've done it before. What? It's not a big deal. Wow. And he, yeah. He goes, so you're going to do what I tell you to do. And I'm like, Oh my gosh. He's like, you're going to be my girlfriend. And I said, I have a boyfriend. He goes, I don't care what you have. Wow. So something inside of me just rose up and I was like, Oh my gosh, I'm so nervous. But he was playing mind games with me for a while. So yeah. he did this for, he did this the whole night. So I'd say about eight hours of mind games back and forth. Yeah. So finally I, I get upset and I actually say to him, I said, listen, he's threatening me. If I don't be his girlfriend, he's telling me to wear street clothes and go in the back and put my, you know, take off my, you know, stripper outfit and put on my jeans and t-shirt that I came in with. And I'm doing it because I'm, I, I'm going to the back and then the manager's coming up to me. What are you doing? I said, this guy's like scaring me. He's threatening my life. If I don't, he's like, Oh my gosh, just sit down and I'll talk to him. I mean, everyone was, you know, all over him. So I knew that he really did have some power, but I didn't know what was going on. He was basically, and I didn't know this at the time because I was so ignorant. I did not do drugs. He was totally high on coke and something else or yeah so anyway and it seems like high. it seems like the like demons were just using them obviously right right <laughs> so he's telling me i got angry and i said listen you know what kind of guy are you you're gonna threaten me to be your girlfriend i go oh is that how you get all your girls you're so hot i go basically you're pathetic if that's how you get your girlfriends they have to be threatened <laughs> And, you know, I'm going to kill you if you're right. So I'm, I kind of like turned it around. And he's like, I can't believe you're talking to me like this. Something inside of me rose up. Like, because he was really starting to press in. Like, it was getting towards the end of the night. And he's like, I'm serious. You're going to be my girlfriend. You're going to go home with me tonight. Yeah. And I'm like, so this fear is like really, really. Because, I mean, who knows? Like. Yeah. what he's going to do. I have no idea. Like he could follow me or whatever. I don't know. So I'm like, Oh my gosh, how am I, what am I going to do? And, and something said, um, that something took over my mouth. I, I don't even know what happened. I go, he's threatening my life. I go, you know what? You could probably kill me. And I could tell by your eyes, you probably have done it. I said, but you know what? I know if I die today, where I go, do you know where you'd go? Whoa. And I looked him straight in the eye I don't even know how that came out of my mouth. Well, the and, Holy he, Spirit. Yeah, he, and he looks at me and he looks like I just socked him in the stomach. Like he's just shocked and he goes, Oh, oh I don't know. No, wow. I don't know. Why, why do you know where I'm going to go? Do you know where I'm going to go? He gets all panicky. And I said, I think you know where you're going to go. Wow. I said, do you really want to go there? And he goes, no, I don't. I don't. I don't. I said, okay. I, he goes, how do you know? How do you know where you're going to go? I said, because I got something inside of me. And I said, you can have it inside of you too. And he's like, okay. I said, I want you to pray with me. And he's like, I can't believe you're going to pull this stuff on me. I goes, no, this is it. This is the real deal. You can be different. You don't, you don't have to go down that road. I said, you could really have God change you. And so he's like, so we pray. He's calling me a whore. He goes, you can't be someone from God. Look at you. You're dressed like a whore. I said, I don't care what I'm dressed like. I know I gave my life to God at some point. He's going to take me. He's going to take me. He, yeah. He's in charge, mm-hmm. not you. And so he's like, so he prays with me yeah, in the strip club, in the middle of the strip club. Oh, wow. And then he tells me, go. He says, leave now. He says, because I don't, there's something wrong with me and I might change my mind in five minutes. He's like, so you better get out of here if you want to live. That's what he tells me. Yeah. So I just hightailed it. I said, my, my girlfriend, we were all supposed to ride together. I said, I'm taking a cab. I'm gone. I'm not coming back. And so that was, that was my thing in New York. And that's like, so that didn't really answer a question about conviction. Yeah. But there was like, there, yes, you know what? Actually, I can answer that question about conviction. Okay. I remember, and this was actually a celebrity. And, um, if he ever hears this interview, um, <laughs> 
Oh, he's such a jerk. I want to <laughs> say who it is so bad. He's such a jerk. And I want to you know, hear his name, I'll but hate. yeah, what? you don't have to. You don't have to say his name. <laughs> well, I kind of want to, but I'll just tell you maybe indirectly who he is. Okay. Anyway, he comes up to me, and I, he sees me on stage, and he calls me up to the VIP, and he's like, "Um, I want you, you know, you to hang out with me for the rest of the night, but I don't want to pay you." Because, you know, because he's a celebrity, so he thinks, I'll be cool and I'll, like, yeah. want to hang out. And I'm like, listen, I don't care who you are. Like, this is my job. This is what I do. I don't, you know, I don't care who, how famous you are. I don't, I need to pay my bills. You know what I mean? So he was, like, not having it. He was getting really mad. You know, like, what? You're not impressed by me? And I'm like, no, I'm really not. <laughs> so, anyway, he looks at me and I'm wearing a cross. I'm like, you know, I've got a beautiful cross. And he goes, look at you. He flips the cross, like on my ne- ne- you know, my necklace, and he goes, "So you believe in God?" He's like, "Oh yeah, that's so, that's so typical." He's like, "Oh my gosh!" And he's like laughing at me because I believe in God and I'm a stripper, and I felt so little because the truth is he was right. Like, oh, you know, who am I to wear a cross? You know, when I'm taking my dress off, you know. Like, what a blasphemous thing to do, you know? It'd be better if I probably wore a satanic symbol on my neck than mm-hmm. wear a cross because that's, you know, it's just blasphemous. Yeah. So I, that really convicted me, and I was like, oh, my gosh, yeah. he's right. And I couldn't say anything to him, you know? Uh, but basically, he he's a talk – he has a really popular talk show um, that um, – and his last yeah. name – Rhymes with car. Hmm. I'm pretty sure someone listening will try to figure it out. <laughs> okay. He's really short. Okay. He's a really angry, bitter man. I mean, he is, he's very, very, like, I'm short. Okay, I'm 4'11", and Whoa. he was, like, like maybe an inch taller than me. <laughs> so okay. bad. Anyway. Wow. Okay. All right. Uh, next question. Um. Well, let me just tell like a little what I've experienced when I went to Hollywood. This was like several years ago. Okay. Um, this was, you know, I was like, I was like backslidden from God. So I go out to Hollywood Boulevard with my friend. We're just like walking down, up and down the street or the sidewalk. And I remember it was like real late at night. And all of a sudden I felt like the most evil, demonic presence over the whole area it just felt like this weight was over me and i couldn't explain i'm like my goodness what what is going on like the whole atmosphere just changed and i felt it felt like a a spirit of of drunkenness a spirit of lust I, i don't know how to explain it but it just felt heavy and it was very palpable i could feel it in my in my bones and i asked my friend who was with me i'm like listen i was like do you do you feel do you feel that it feels like there's something evil in the air and like he was like no i i don't i don't feel anything and i'm like looking around i see all these people nonchalant like they're just oblivious to what i'm feeling Mm -hmm. yeah and looking back i knew what was going on i was just i was just demons (laughs) in the air so yeah so my question is for you is like, did, did the atmosphere change or did you feel the atmosphere being different when you entered like a strip club or, or a club in general? Did that, did you have ever had that kind of experience that I had? You know, what's funny that you said that? I think it's so interesting, Jamal, because not actually in the strip club. There's two places that I felt the exact same way that you were describing and LA is one of them. And so my husband, I used to model out there for trashy lingerie and and he used to go back and forth to the Playboy Mansion. And Mm -hmm. every time I went out there, I got the heebie-jeebies and I said, I cannot hang out here. And so my friends were like, and my agent was like, if you go out to LA, you get so much more work and blah, 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 blah. And my husband was like, you know, at the time we were dating, he's like, I really want to go out there. You know, maybe you should move out there too and just give it a, a good go. And I said, I can't, I can't. The atmosphere, I hate it. I hated it when I visited him. I could feel the dark heaviness. There's that place and New Orleans. I mm. kid you not. As soon as the plane landed, I could feel a jolt in my body. It's like the same thing as I was on stage, except it wasn't a good feeling. It was like, 
like I, I felt nervous and anxious and mm. like really like uncomfortable because it would just it just hit me and I could like I almost would say I could feel it come up my nostrils if that makes sense it was mm-hmm. just a really bizarre feeling and right now I live in San Diego mm-hmm. and I I've, I've lived in Chicago my whole life mm. so you know I have not like I really want to know if I go back to Chicago if I will feel the spirits there because mm-hmm. you know when you're living in an atmosphere you're maybe not so aware of it yeah because you, you know so, to compare so it to. like here you were visiting LA and you became aware of this, this is not normal yeah. so I don't know if like I become just so accustomed to the stuff in the, in the atmosphere of Chicago that now I've uh, removed myself from that environment and I might experience a different feeling when I go out there because there's Obviously, so much stuff going down in Chicago. Right. We moved because of the violence. We just couldn't, we couldn't live in violence anymore. We lived yeah. in the best neighborhood and it was still violent, you know? <laughs> wow. So. Yeah. No, I could, I don't, I can't really say that with the strip clubs. There was, there were some strip clubs that were, so the, the, the strip clubs that I worked at were called gentleman clubs. They weren't like strip clubs, strip mm-hmm. clubs. So there's different. There's different levels. So of what's, the, and what's I, the difference? So there's there's strip clubs that allow touching. There's strip clubs that are all nude. There's mm. like especially in Florida, they like anything goes. If you're in in Las Vegas, the prostitution is legal. So I work at what was called the gentleman's club, and I work usually like Chicago is so conservative. New York was conservative. You know, it was like a gentleman's club. So you wear evening gowns. They're very long. They're very glamorous. You're not mm-hmm. wearing like, you know, little, you know, booty shorts. And that's, that's <laughs> not the kind of clubs, you know. Yeah. So it depends on the club that you work at. So one time I, me and my girlfriends, we traveled and we went out to Atlanta and the strip clubs there are horribly, we work at this club called the Gold Club that actually got shut down right. for prostitution. Mm-hmm. It was just so, horrible but anyway that and the manager would the manager basically tries to turn tries to be a pimp and he tries to pimp you out and um that place i could feel it was just i i had to quit because i was like i can't handle this this is just they're they're not letting me be an independent contractor they're really trying to they were trying to pimp you you know and yeah. i didn't like that so to feel pressured that oh you have to go in the vip with this guy and i i mean i have a funny story to share with you with that this one guy was insisting on going to VIP with me. And I didn't want to go because I, I walked by the VIPs and I saw there was shenanigans going on in there. And I said, listen, I'm going to go on the dance floor and I'll, I'll, I'll make $20 a dance on the floor instead of making $600 per hour. And I get to sit down and hang out with this guy that's going to try and stick his hands all over me. I'd rather just do $20 at a dance. They couldn't touch you on the floor. There, there was none of that. You know, that's what, how they, um, up, you know, they would upsell you to the VIP because they give you something more up there, you know? Mm -hmm. And so this guy was chasing me around trying to get me to go in the VIP. He's like, no, no, I'm not going to do it. So finally the manager's like, you have to do it. He like forced me to do it. So I say to the customer, I say to him, I said, listen, I don't want to go up there. And if you make me go up there, that's cool. You're paying for it. Run your credit card right now. Mm -hmm. And I said, if you touch me once, you are done. And he's like, okay, okay, I promise. Mm -hmm. So we get in there. He sticks his hand on my leg. I scream. I said, that's it. It's <laughs> over. And so I put my hand, to, you know, like crossed over my body. And I was like, you just paid for an hour of me. And I just gave him a dirty look the whole hour. It was so, <laughs> so bad. Like, I was like, this, if you guys are going to make me do this, this is what you're going to get. Like, I, I can't do this. Because for me, that was crossing a line. Like, um, I had been sexually abused you know, when I was younger. So because of that, like the, no man was ever going to touch me ever. Mm -hmm. The whole point of me being a stripper and was having power over men to hurt men, but I never wanted a man to touch me and, and take, you know, take it. I just, to me, that was very like, it made me feel nauseous to just even think about that. So no one got, especially a guy giving me money to touch me. That was like, so Anyway, my whole thing is there's different clubs. So different things happen at different clubs and different clubs feel very different. Yeah. Okay. And, um, I, I heard in, uh, one of your interviews that, um, that you opened yourself up to more demons because 
there was like a money transaction, even though the guys didn't touch you or anything like that, right. you received the money from them. And somehow that just, you know, opened up more de- doorways for demons to come into you. Can, okay, can you so, you know, there's a Bible verse that says, yeah. uh, the man looks upon you in his heart and he lusts after you. Right. He's, per- he's committed a sin in his heart. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. So what the Lord showed me was when I was casting out, like, so every, you know, if you, I danced for 12 years. Every single time I performed a dance, I did what was, I had what was called a soul tie with that customer. Right. Now imagine every night that I worked, I probably danced for at least oh, over a hundred guys. Imagine that. A hundred guys a night. I work five nights a week. Imagine how many soul ties. Just yeah, imagine that. Yeah. So what happens is, and the reason why a soul tie is connected is, is because in the Bible it says, any person that, you know what, actually I have that Bible verse. Let me go look it up. Mm-hmm. I have it right here. Um, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his, in his heart. Mm-hmm. And then there's another Bible verse that says, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. So what I had done, even though I didn't technically sleep with them, um, God looks at the heart, Mm -hmm. you know? And so he saw that I was open to allowing these men to lust after me. I gave them permission. I said, okay, you want to give me $20? You can lust over me. That's pretty much what the exchange was. And because I gave them permission, now I'm an active participant in their sin. Mm. Even though I wasn't thinking lustful thoughts, I was thinking about my grocery list. I was thinking about what I was going to do. I mean, you have no idea what these girls are not thinking. Most of them are not thinking sexual thoughts. You know, that's going to crush all the people that listen. <laughs> but I'm just going to tell, pop your bubble right here. Those strippers are, are not thinking about you and they're not thinking of sexual <laughs> thoughts. So, but I became an active participant in this man's sin because of that. So that's what the Lord revealed to me. Wow, wow. Now, lust is a very powerful force or sin. Um, you know, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, especially for, for men. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm pretty sure you, since you've been in the whole industry for a, a long time, you must have saw, like, just the horrible side of humanity, um, because of these sins. Um, I mean, did you see like a lot of married men, um, who are just in bondage to the sin that, you know, that will compel them to go to the strip club? Um, I mean, did you see a lot of that there? You know, it's not like married men usually don't come out and say it, Mm -hmm. you know, so it, but yes, I, I, sadly, I had a regular customer that, I really liked as a person and I know that that I cared about him as a person. He was a very good person. And, um, that was a soul tie that I, you know, I had with him. I never, you know, went home with him. I never, you know, went on a date with him. There was never, it wasn't that kind of relationship on my end. He just was a very kind person. And in that, in my life at that time, I had no friends and he was an actually really good person. So, and he'd come in and he didn't, he wasn't a millionaire and I wasn't into, you know, taking a million dollars from him. So, you know, I just liked him as a person. Mm-hmm. And, um, I saw the bondage that he had to me and God really convicted me about that. You know, that, um, I knew that I wasn't in love with him and I didn't like him. And so I had to like pretty much tell him, you know, I, when I did get married and I was still dancing at the time, I actually told him, I sat him down. I said, listen, I don't tell anyone this, but I got to tell you because I'm married. Like, and I know that you're in your mind, you're thinking, Oh, one day she'll one day. Well, no, Mm. it's not ever going to happen, you know? Um, but I, you know what? I'm, I'm totally losing track of like, what was your question? Like, like, cause of of the bondage. Yeah. Cause cause a lot of, a lot of, a lot of men, even women these days are, they're in bondage to lust. And when they give into it, it just, they do, a lot of crazy things to fulfill that lust. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, yes, I saw, I saw that all the time. And I think that there's the Bible verse that comes to mind for that 
is God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power and of love and of a sound mind. And I think that lust, a lot of times, it's Satan's version of love. Mm. And a lot of times people fear of being alone. And lust feels good because it's, it's fulfilling for that one moment. But um, I think that we're living in an age that everybody wants that immediate gratification. Right. Nobody wants to wait for anything. Right. And unfortunately, lust is, it's everywhere. You just turn on the TV for five minutes and every single Absolutely. ad is going to elicit lust of the flesh in some way, it, whether it be food or whether it be women or whether it be, you know, gambling or whatever. We're, it's, the, it's just, we're overly um, exposed to that type of stuff. And so I feel like that a lot of people feel like, well, it's my treat. I deserve it. I've been good. I deserve a little bad. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I'm going to balance the, you know, weigh out the balances or whatever. So, um, we don't, we haven't learned the power of, um, being self-controlled, of allowing right. someone right. else to say, to take over. So we, you know, as a Christian, you know, we're still struggling with lust. I still yeah. struggle with lusting after beautiful things. You know, maybe <laughs> yeah. I don't lust yeah. after this, but I lust after something different. You know, and the Lord's showing me, you need to fast from that. So I got to, you know, he had me on a fast from my email. Like I literally had to delete every single sale that came into my email. <laughs> wow. delete that. Why? Because I'm not addicted to porn. I'm addicted to shopping. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, it's, it comes in different forms and yeah. for different reasons, but it's all the same thing. You know, it's all going to pull you away from your first love. Right, right. And I, I know a lot of Christians, uh, men and women, are in bondage to sexual lust. Like, I've read a, a study or a statistic, I don't know if it's accurate or not, but, like, roughly half of Christians are, you know, addicted to pornography. And so it's really something that's really plaguing uh, the body of Christ. Yeah. yeah. And what do you feel like is the solution for that? I feel like a man should, as, as a Holy Spirit led man, how do you feel like is giving you victory or, or is helping you with your, that struggle for you? Yeah. I don't mean, would you yeah. be willing to share that or? Yeah, definitely. I mean, for me, what works for me is to cut it at the, at the root. Mm. Yeah. Don't, don't give in to even like looking at a woman in a, or at her legs or, you know, anything that will, that will trigger you to look further, you know, because you don't want to go that route. <laughs> yeah. So you just want to cut it at the root. And another thing is you, you have to control your thoughts because when you're dealing with lust, you know, sometimes your imagination runs wild mm -hmm. and you have to really, you know, think of something else. Think of a scripture. Think of, mm -hmm. you know, think of, think of God. Um, I, and another thing I, I have to say is that, um, okay, secular women don't, they don't understand, but Christian women, you, you have to dress or you should dress modestly. Cause I see, sometimes I see Christian women who dress provocatively. And I, I don't think women really understand, you know, how it, easy it is for men to fall fall into the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes because men are tend to be more visual so you know i would really encourage uh christian women to yeah dress more modestly and that's biblical you know right right totally so yeah it's really it's been a it's been a really strange battle for me because um I understand from a man's point of view, just from being around men and, and what my husband, you know, shares with me. Mm -hmm. And then as a woman too, a married woman, you want to stay attractive for your husband. Mm -hmm. And if all these girls are out there running around and this or that, and then you put your big moo moo on and you go to church <laughs> all the time, yeah. you just feel like, okay, put a fork in me. Yeah. This is exactly why I didn't want to be a Christian. Yeah. If someone makes me wear culottes, it's done. Yeah. So, so if there's also like, I'm like, God, what do you want me to do with this? Like, here my husband is, and he gets to look at all these women in all these fashionable kind of, you know, provocative outfits. And then I feel like I'm not even attracted to him anymore. And mm. the Lord showed me that the beauty from the inside is so important. That my soul is, when I nurture my soul and I, and I become more like Christ, that I truly am more beautiful to him. And that, makes me attractive, you know, and it, I'm not going to let myself go. I stay in shape, 
He's like, but you don't need to display the goods, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Pretty much. And so, like, really, I noticed that when I pray about that and I really work with the Lord and I let him change me, I could see my husband becoming more attracted to I notice a difference. I get a response from him. And it's like, wow, I'm not wearing anything more provocative. <laughs> but I feel like the closer I get to the Lord, the more in love I, I notice a response from him, which is really cool. So it's not like, I think that, um, but it's different because we're married. So I, I think that things are like, I think that when a woman is respecting herself enough to not show it all, it shows that she values herself. And I think that is beautiful. It's someone who respects themselves and values themselves. You know who I really admire that dresses beautiful? And to me, it's not provocative. I think it's very tasteful. Mm -hmm. I think that Ivanka Trump dresses unbelievable, like a lady. Mm. She she looks feminine. She looks beautiful. And she never looks provocative. I haven't seen her in anything that makes me go, whoa, you know? What's on with that? And <laughs> yeah. I just think she looks beautiful though and tasteful. Yeah. So, I mean, it's good for women, Christian women to kind of try and see like, okay, you know, this, everything's covered and I still look, you know, present, you know, good, I yeah, guess. Yeah. yeah. Now okay. this, this is like getting popular for whatever reason. I, I see a lot of, a lot of the younger generation practicing this, which is astral projection. Now it's, People listening, if you don't know what that is, that is when you leave your, you actually leave your body, your spirit or your soul leaves your body and you just, you travel in the spirit or what they call the astral realm. Um, when you were doing that, like, 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 what did you see? And, and I don't know, like, what, what, what went on? <laughs> I almost don't really want to tell people because then they're going to want to do it. But yeah, that, yeah, that. It wasn't anything like, it was, it was the sensation of flying. It yeah. was amazing. And mm -hmm. I could, and I could jump like it, I, I would be able to jump and like, and then just spring off and be able to fly. And I was flying and looking in people's windows and it was just weird. Yeah. Um, and it was, it was just an amazing experience that if I didn't know what I know today, mm -hmm. you know, I'd want to do it. So I don't really like talking about it too much because I don't want to get pique people's yeah. interest to the point where they're going to get but, oppressed, you know? Yeah. And I'm so, just, I just let, <laughs> let the people know who are listening that it is truly demonic. It's it, the yeah. demons that are doing that to you. And it's not by your own power. It's totally demonic. Well, and this is the thing too. The Bible mentions a silver cord. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And um, my grandfather mentioned that too. Mm -hmm. And Scientology believes in that. Well, well, this whole astral projection thing is you have a silver cord that's kind of keeping you um, in line, I guess. And or, then if it yeah. snaps, you, you die. You, leave, you die, <laughs> right? You, you get. So, like, that's not nothing to play around with. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just. It's just not. If you're, if you for some reason pass while you're doing that, you're not going to a good spot. I wouldn't risk it. You know, like you don't know once your body leaves, once your soul is out there, you're vulnerable and, um, you don't know what else could be getting in and just oppressing you from, from those experiences. Right. Um, it happened. You know, what's weird is I stopped doing it even though I, I didn't hear it was wrong. I felt it in my, I was a kid and I yeah. just knew you know what, this is scary. Like I, I just felt like, you know, this is not good. Even yeah. though it's fun, it's, it was actually kind of, it kind of freaked me out a little mm. bit too, cause I knew something wasn't right in it. So. All right. Yeah. I, I had an experience many years ago where I had a sleep paralysis attack uh -huh. and I felt like demons were trying to pull me out of my body, but I resisted. And, uh -huh. I, and I, I think probably I would have had, you know, an astral projection experience. If I didn't resist, so. Right, yeah, yeah. right. So it's totally yeah, demonic. Right. There are people online on, on the internet who are arguing with me on this issue. And it's the issue about Christians having a demon indwelled in their body. Mm. Now, they will say to me, you know, those Christians who, whom you cast the devils out of people, out of them, they weren't truly saved. They weren't truly born again. They, they can't 
have the Holy Spirit and demons and do all in their body. But I'm telling them, like, listen, like, some of the people I've cast devils out of, I'm, like, good friends with them. I, I know their character. I know they love the Lord. You know, they, they pray to God. We, we read the word together. They believe in the core tenets of, of the Christian faith. So how can you say that they're not really, you know, truly Christian? But you were a true born again Christian. You had a born again experience. You had the Holy Spirit indwelled in you. Correct? Yeah. Yeah. But you know, we also are, we're also living in a fallen world. Yeah. And a lot of the oppression that we have on us. So let's say, let's say I got saved and, and, um, I'm just a regular person and didn't have like the whole experience that I had. But except for my grandfather was involved in the occult, but I never played with the Ouija board. Let's just say my grandfather was involved in the occult. Um, you could still cast a demon out of somebody because of what their grandfather did. Do you mm. see? So the, the doors in the spiritual realm are open. The devil is a legalist. He's going to take advantage of that. You know, just because you come to Christ doesn't mean all your problems are figured out. And here's a perfect example. I know people that are saved and love the Lord that struggle with addiction to alcohol. Mm -hmm. They love the Lord. You know, this is something that we're warring against. It's not even like the, these people want to stop drinking and there's, they have a problem, you know, um, do they, do I believe that they're saved? Yes. They're dealing with an addiction, a spirit, you know? So, um, I, it's not like, I, I think the, the confusion comes from the term, saying demonic possession yeah. it's because then it, it implies ownership. Right, so what right. really happens is I call it a demonic infestation. Mm. So we have like the, okay. So in the old Testament, you know, there was the temple and then there was the outer court and then there was the inner court and then there was the Holy of Holies. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, the best way for me to describe it would be like when you get saved, Jesus comes into your Holy of Holies, but then you still got to clean up the inner court and the outer court, which is like the soul and the spirit. So there's like different levels of you. You know, the very depths of you could be saved and filled with the Holy Spirit. Right, but God right. wants to clear out those other areas. And I think that in my thing, if I would have died during my experience, I would have gone to heaven because I called out on the name of Jesus mm -hmm. and I was saved. But in that time, during that two years, demons were crawling out of me in that during those two years. Yeah. How do you explain that? You can't tell me that during that process of deliverance, if I would have died during that two years, that God would have just not taken me. Right. But yet I was Good having point. demons crawl out of me. So how do you explain that? I was a Christian and I had demons crawling out of me. And like we were talking about with the woman, you know, that Jesus was casting demons out of people in the synagogue. Right. So it's just, I, it's when it's, Something that people are really get really up in arms about. And it's almost like, you know what? Just pray for them that the Lord will reveal what he's revealed to you. Love them where they're at and, you know, accept that that's where they're at. But, you know, I wouldn't make it a thing where you're, you know, you're going to con continuously fight with them over it. Because yeah, they're just yeah. usually not going to change their mind until they actually experience it themselves. And they're going to go, whoa, whoa, you know. <laughs> yeah. And I, and I asked them. The simple question, have you ever cast a devil out of someone? And all the, like, almost all the time they'll say no. I'm no, like, <laughs> right? right? That's interesting. Yeah, because they have, they have no experience in that area. I have never met a deliverance minister who said that a Christian cannot have a demon. Ne not, not one. I never met not even one deliverance minister. So. Well, you know why? Think about it. Deliverance ministries are ministering to people in church. Right. So, right. You know? And it doesn't, and they're not, they're yeah. not going out in the street casting out demons. And it, you know? it, it doesn't even make sense to cast a devil out of someone who's not saved or not seeking the Lord because the demons will just come right back once they, exactly. once they sin. So, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Good point. <laughs> yeah. So, um, uh, when you were praying for deliverance, um, how, how, how did the demons come out? Like, how did it manifest? Cause when I pray for deliverance, People usually yawn or they tear up or they cough or sometimes they even vomit. What was it like for, for you? Oh, it was different for each one. Like it was so, it was so weird because I had the process of two years 
um, I had so many different experiences. I had, yes, the yacht, yawning and the coughing and the, there was even, you know, gas and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. You know, it just comes from, uh, foaming at the mouth. I, I literally, I remember being woken up in the middle of the night and I'm just crawling out because, you know, I've been reading the Bible all day and they just were uncomfortable. Yeah. But I remember specifically feeling like, like a hot snake was in my foot, like wow. inside, inside of my body. Yeah. And it was slithering and moving up my body. I could feel the heat moving up all the way up my leg, all the way up my inner thigh. And I, and then it left through my mouth. Yeah. <laughs> it was just, so I've actually felt physical sensations of um, like a spider inside my body. Mm. I could feel a spider crawling around like yeah. and tickling. It kind of felt tickly and then that come out. So it's just, and then I felt, you know, just foam, just foam was just coming out of my mouth. Wow. And yeah. So it's just weird. Yeah. Very yeah. different and, and not predictable. Mm-hmm. It's It'll be different for each person. Yeah, yeah, it has been different for like most people I pray for. Like some people just they vomit, just slime. I don't know how to explain it. What it? I don't know what it is. You know, some people just cough. Some people just like fall to the ground, and I don't mm-hmm. know. It just manifests different ways. You know? So, um, so like, what are you doing now to nurture your relationship with God and and to draw closer to Him? Well, um, in this season where I feel like the Lord wants me to go and show his love. So, um, you know, I, so I, I moved from Chicago and we mm. moved out to San Diego and the first thing we did was find a church and yeah. I was really looking for a church and, you know, that was good preaching. And, uh, of course we wanted one that understood deliverance because I believe it's something that you should get on a regular basis. Mm. So as a believer who believes in deliverance, I get deliverance. You know, I have friends pray over me because I believe that we need to continue that. And then I make sure that I keep my life as clean as possible. And, um, and when I, when I mean dirty, I don't, it's, it's not like I am having some huge struggle with some crazy sin. Like I'm telling you, it's lust. It's lust of like shopping, Mm -hmm. you know, it's just, but that is still a problem and it's still an idol and it's still something God doesn't want. You know, and so I have to fast from shopping. I have to fast from, you know, certain TV shows Mm -hmm. that just are not lifting God up. You know, what what really is nowadays? So to nurture my relationship with him, I purposely do not listen to secular music at all. I get (laughs) it just rubs me the wrong way. When I listen to it, my friends are like, don't you get bored of listening to worship? No, I do not. (laughs) Because there's something that enters in the. The presence yeah. of God is with worship music. And then I listen to this garbage and, you know, unless it's like something from way back in the seventies, there's just such garbage in the lyrics mm-hmm. that I can't mm-hmm. even weed it out. Like why bother? You know? Mm-hmm. So, and there's this heavy oppression that comes when, because literally the, the music of the world is uplifting the ideals of the world, which is uplifting Satan's kingdom right, you know right. at the end of the day if what what are they singing about they're singing about the lust of the flesh look at their videos if you just like i'm working out at my gym and they just have you know music videos going on so i catch it and i you know i see what the weekend is doing tossing around the cross you know that's neon i mean there's just blasphemy weaved in and out of all of this stuff everyone's staring at the mirror and looking at the different personalities coming back out selena gomez is doing that britney spears does yeah. that so you know lady gaga you know they're just they're just uplifting you know let's if you have a mental disorder if you you know if you have schizophrenia it's cool because britney spears did you know and it's just i don't know it, it to me it just um, it's feeding the wrong thing. So I try consciously to feed on the right thing as much as possible and get either be reading a book that's uplifting and is uplifting my faith or encouraging me in some way in the Lord. Going to my Bible studies, I, I um, go to church and I serve at church and then I'm, you know, serving too at some ministries, just getting involved. Mm-hmm. Um, so my life is filled with things that remind me of what really matters instead of filling my life with a lot of garbage that doesn't matter. Amen and, to that, yeah. And, um, 
that it's it sounds like people go, oh, that sounds so boring. It's really not. It's so much fun to be available for God and to see mm-hmm. how God can use you. And it's like that's exciting, actually. I don't. It's really not boring at all. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Awesome. All right, man. So, but um, you have a, a book out. Um, just please tell the listeners about it and how to purchase it. Great. Well, thanks. Um, it's actually called Breaking Free. Um, from Demonic Forces and by Julia Shalom Jordan and you can get it off of Amazon and or you can get it off my website um, shalombewithyou.com and um, if you can't get a book it's not a big deal because I have all the information that you would need to help you with spiritual warfare on my website so my book is like my testimony and what I went through um, and then it has deliverance prayers so it explains the process of deliverance but uh, if you just want to cut to the chase and just get some help and some healing and just have the deliverance stuff, that's all available on my website. So, awesome. um, you know, freely I've been given. So freely I like to make sure that it's available. And um, that's it. Yeah. Awesome. Pretty much. I'm, I'm working on a rewrite. So the book that you, you, you know, that you get right now in a couple, I, I'd like to say in a year, but. I've been working on the rewrite for like a year and a half and I'm like, oh, still <laughs> just, so it's going to be available in a little bit. Let's just say that. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. And I'll, I'll leave a link to, uh, the Amazon, um, where oh, your book great. is and to your website. So I'll leave that in the description box when I upload it. So uh, yeah. And, um, people can reach out to me if they need prayer because I, I pray for people for free. You know, oh, yeah, so if, if anyone out there needs prayer for deliverance, if you have any kind of demonic issues, just uh, feel free to reach out to me, and I'll and I'll I'll pray for you in, in the name of Jesus. So um yeah, so Julia, do you want to um close in prayer? Sure. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> dear Heavenly Father, I just um I want to thank you for the opportunity to share um what you've done for me, and I want to thank you for Jamal and his ministry. That um, I just pray that you would send him more people that have had experiences that people can relate mm-hmm. to. And Lord, I just pray for the hearts of everyone who's heard um, our stories here today that um, that you would just um, speak your truth to them, that they that you would reveal yourself to each person, that even if they don't believe it or kind of questioning it, that things that would pop up in their lives, Lord, that you would reveal how you're watching out for them and how you've protected them and um, show them how you're pursuing them. Uh, Lord, I know that me and Jamal, that you love us, but I know we're nothing special, that we're your children, but that you have more children out there that you want to pursue. And so these days are wicked and evil. And so I just pray that um, those who are tired of their lives, who are thinking that there's no hope, I, I pray that you would um, just compel them to open up a Bible or to reach out to a friend who knows you and just explore who Jesus is. And Lord, that the, you would reveal um, yourself and your love and that the power of God would be in every person's lives that are hearing this message today in Jesus name. Amen. 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 Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. I really appreciate it. It was yeah. a really wonderful experience. And yeah. thanks for putting up with all my, like, I'm like, I don't want to forget this Bible <laughs> verses. I keep forgetting. And I could just go on. Yeah. Look yeah. At- no problem. It's, yeah. People need to hear, hear the scripture. So that that's awesome. 